Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content, this helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. Around a decade ago, a friend from church asked me to join his family on a camping trip to a wilderness reserve called Oasis State Park. Of course, since this was my best friend and his family had always been nice, I said yes. Up until that point, I had only camped rarely, so the prospect of camping with a friend and his family seemed absolutely amazing. So we began preparing for a weekend when I wasn't busy. I got my own tent, my own sleeping bag, and my own supplies. Once all that was gathered, the father of the friend came and picked me up and my parents waved me off. There are quite a few things I remember from that trip. The amazingly hostile yet beautiful New Mexico countryside, the plateaus, and the campsite. The New Mexican wilderness isn't something a lot of people fantasize about camping in. At least not so far as I know, but Oasis State Park is different. The camping plots are all nice even if the best are always taken. There's a pretty lake, lots of wildlife, and I hate to admit, more trees than I've ever seen in town. Yeah, I know nobody thinks of multitudes of trees when they think of New Mexico, and for good reason. They aren't the most common occurrence in the plains unless planted by people. Regardless, Oasis has enough for me to just use the term woods for the sake of brevity. So anyways, we found ourselves a plot and began setting up our tents. By afternoon the tents were set and me and my friend ditched his oh-so-boring younger sister in favor of exploring the park. The memories are fantastic. We found a snake by the lake and watched it drink from the water before slithering off quickly. We explored a place I remember was very sandy. We watched a roadrunner doing its thing. We played all day after lunch and saw so many amazing things that by the end of the day I never would have thought anything could go wrong. We finished the day like you always do, by collecting sticks and starting a fire to eat s'mores and tell ghost stories. None of the stories were scary, probably because me and my friend were kids and his sister was an even younger child. That and his father was lead singer at our church and making children cry was bad for reputation. So by ghost stories, I mean little jokes of stories designed to make us giggle more than cry. Yeah, it was lame, but what do you expect? Anyways, shortly after the stories were said and s'mores were eaten, we retired, me to my tent, and my friend, his father, and his sister, to their tent. Now for this setup, I'll explain positioning. This is all going to be important. My tent was at one edge of the plot and my friend's tent was at the exact opposite. This was for privacy reasons. Now at my end of the plot was a mini trail that lead through thick brush to the lake. Also about three feet from my tent was a little tree. IDK what kind of tree it was, but it was still young and small. The trail to the lake was to the left of my tent entrance. The lake was behind it, and a thin tree line sat across a trail in front of my tent. That trail in front of my tent led to the bathrooms. So I went to bed without a single bit of fear and before I did, I went ahead and urinated on the tree outside my tent because of laziness. Screw the two-minute walk to the bathrooms when nature's toilet was outside my tent. So I finished closing up my tent for the night and climbed into my sleeping bag to go to bed. I don't know how long I slept, but when I woke, I had to use the bathroom, and it wasn't the kind of pottying I could do on a tree, or at least not reasonably. So I, not being a moron who'd wander through the dark, grabbed my little lantern. I flipped on my LED lantern, and I unzipped the inner flap of my tent before the outer. As if that little nylon net could protect me from what I was about to see. Now I should mention that outside of cities in New Mexico, it's quite common to hear coyote howls. It's a nightly occurrence when camping. Heck, even up in a little village like Logan, you can hear the howls from your bedroom. It isn't so unnerving when you're in a house, but when you got some flimsy nylon walls to protect you, and that's it. Well, it isn't the most comforting sound. As I unzipped my tent flap, I did hear a few howls, but they were distant and not worrying. What stunned me into stillness was a very loud howl from the direction of the lake, about a yard from my tent at most. This howl was different though. It had the feel of a coyote howl, but it was deeper and it lasted longer. I simply sat there petrified at what I heard. I wouldn't be able to guess at how long I sat there breathing hard with my fingers still grasping the zipper. But however long it may have been was just long enough for the thing. 
That made that howl to come up the trail next to my tent. Suddenly I heard the crunching of claws on dirt, and after that, claws on the rocks that made our camping plots. Then I saw the largest shadow made by a living creature that little kid me had ever seen. It lumbered heavily in the direction of the sparse tree line where I assumed the other howling had come from. But before it got past the tree, I urinated on it stopped. I realized only then that I was both lit like a candle and had not been trying to silence my heaving breathing. By then it was too late as that hulking thing lumbered over closer to the tree and into the light of my lantern. As dim as the little LED light was at that distance, it was just barely enough to make out details. I'd like to note a few very important details that stuck out to me as odd. It had roughly the fur coloring of a coyote, but that classic dogman head shape with the tiny pointed ears, too small to make sense. It also made strange noises as it lowered to all fours in front of my tent, popping sounds like joints rubbing together as I can only assume its knees busted out of their standing joints and fell into different joints to support all fours. It briefly ignored the very obviously frightened kid me in my tent as it sniffed the tree I had urinated on. The breaths were similar to a dog's but longer and far deeper, almost like a horse's. Then that thing turned to me and stared straight into my eyes. Its eyes didn't glow, they didn't peer into my soul, but they were unbelievably unnatural. Above all the things I saw in those eyes, I saw a predator. Have you ever been in a position where you made eye contact with a beast you know is stronger than you? Something you know could just slaughter you? And you know it knows you know. Just looking for seemingly so damn long that I thought for sure I'd just be a bloody stain by the time anyone reached my tent. Screaming would do nothing. I doubted a gun would even hurt this thing. But despite every feeling in my gut, despite the dread of knowing it was predator and I was prey, I didn't die. Instead, it turned slowly, ever so slowly, and just fucking sprinted off into the woods. Just fucking gone into the night faster than it came. I have one personal friend who knows and he jokes that made it was my piss on that tree. Like I marked my territory or something dumb like that. Or maybe it just wasn't hungry. Or most improbable, it had just enough morals to not kill a kid. I'll never really know. Needless to say, I didn't go to the bathroom. I just put my lantern away, closed my tent flap, and held it all night. I don't remember sleeping that night. I might have, I might not, but if I did it was dreamless. I do remember that I tried to hide this experience the next day, asking if my friend and his family heard any howling. While they did hear the howling, they told me they just ignored it thinking it was a coyote doing coyote stuff. I was encouraged to just ignore it as if I was a city kid who had never heard coyote howling before. That next day I stayed as close to my friend as possible while exploring and had nearly forgotten the encounter by lunch. Somehow the safety I had been feeling during the day put the beast out of my mind until we found tracks in that super sandy place, coyote tracks. I think seeing those tracks confirmed to me that it wasn't just some dream. And because of that, I showed enough fear that night to convince my friend's family to let me sleep in their tent. Even in the comfort of a warmer tent, more people means more warmth. And in the presence of an adult, the father, and two other people, friend and his sister, I couldn't sleep that night. I'd nearly drift into sleep and then I'd hear a coyote howl. The next day I pretended to be sick and got my mother to drive up and take me home a day or two early. Worst camping trip of my life, it ruined not only my whole summer, but also ruined camping. I haven't been camping without a tent buddy since and I don't plan to. Even then I'm never comfortable, always listening for strange noises and acting paranoid. This really fucked me up I guess, being forced to see that a human, top of the food chain, is utterly powerless in front of such a beast. Seriously. I don't think I can press hard enough to make everyone realize how powerless I felt. Even today, when I think about this, I remember two things first. Those eyes, and that feeling. Just writing this sent multiple shivers up my spine. That said, you might be asking why I'm talking about this again if it terrifies me so much. Simple. I both want answers, and I want to add to the conversation. I feel the need to add this encounter so that others can experience it. Maybe contact me with questions, or answers. So let me say now that if you have any idea what happened that night, PLS respond or DM.
If you have any questions, go ahead and do the same. A few months back, one of my friends opened up to me about a creature he said he encountered two times around New Jersey, where my mother lives. This same friend and I have encountered a skinwalker in the past while being in New Jersey, and he told me when he was just a boy he saw something in the fields next to his house. Whatever he saw still terrifies him to this day. He's had two encounters with this creature, one in the middle of the day when he was a boy, and one waking up in the middle of the night. Here are his encounters with the alleged dogman. These stories are also from his perspective so I could capture that narrative feel. I hope you enjoy his stories. Hi, my name is Ted, and I've lived in New Jersey all my life. Since I was a kid, I've had all sorts of paranormal and creature experiences for a long time, which I can also tell here in the future at some point. I'm a heavy believer in the supernatural and in dogmen and cryptids just like my friend Sam here. Here are two of my encounters with what I think are dogmen. It was a clear, sunny day as I was walking alongside a trail that was close to my house. I was only about seven or eight years old at the time. It was so beautiful out that day, and as a young kid I was taking it all in. I was having an adventure, picturing myself just running through the open fields waiting for mom and dad to get home. The trail I was on had beautiful scenery all around with tall grass and miles of fields to my left and dense forest to my right. I was just walking through the woods as whenever my parents weren't home, that's what I used to do. I was enjoying the walk, taking in all the feels of nature. The smell of the woods was intoxicating as well as the chirping birds. Then the woods fell silent. I felt like someone or something was watching me and my eyes darted around the entire area. I then looked to my left and noticed something in the tall grass. To me, it looked like a big dog, but then I saw it was crouched down like a man would be if he were hiding. It was covered in brown fur, looked like it had a muzzle and ears like a German shepherd, and had eyes that were blood red. I thought it was more curious than frightening to me, but I was still on edge. I was scared for a bit, but I acted like I didn't notice it, and just went along my day and ran back to my house. I never spoke about this encounter with any of my family, as they would think I'm crazy. But that was my first encounter with what I think was a dogman. The second encounter only happened about four or five years ago. At this point, I lived in a different house. This house was close to a large forest, and the biggest predators I've seen around here have been either coyotes or foxes. Now what I saw that night was no coyote. I woke up in the middle of the night with my throat dry and realized I was thirsty. I went to the kitchen to get some water, when I felt a
finally noticed. He only faced me for a millisecond before collapsing onto all fours and scampering off down the street. I sighed in relief. I should have really filmed it so that my friends would finally believe it. Or maybe I should have just moved away to some place where this shit doesn't happen to people. Christ. I turned back into the house, pulling out my phone to try and convince Tara and the others that it happened again. 1611, 919, 1427. I was walking down the street with two shopping bags in each hand when I heard the chanting. At first, I didn't pay attention to it. I was too concentrated on hauling my shopping along, determined to get in my door despite the plastic handles cutting into my palms. But as I passed the garden, it caught my attention. Five children held hands and spun in a circle. One of them I recognized as my neighbor's son, Sam. When I moved in two months ago, he ran over to give me a rhubarb tart as a welcome gift sort of thing from his mom. He seemed fine, just your average 11-year-old boy. I'm not great with kids, I'll be honest. But even so, they usually don't scare me. But standing and listening to this nursery rhyme was a different story altogether. Watch him scrounging in the street. Dog man, dog man, let leave him out some food to eat. A dog man, dog man, a tell him, sit down, good boy, stay. To dog man, dog man, he only ever wants to play. Or dog man, dog man, but he won't be happy if he's not fed. Dog man, dog man, you'll have to shoot him in the head. The last part was a delighted scream as every kid fell to the grass with their finger pointed to the sky like a pistol. They all dissolved into fits of laughter. I walked a little quicker on the way home. 19 to 11, 19, 16, 13. Tara, I have to get out of here. My girlfriend sighed impatiently over FaceTime. She squinted right at me through her glasses. Is it so bad? I thought you said the neighborhood looked fine. That was before I moved in. I protested, holding my phone in one hand while I dug into my crisp packet with the other. I didn't consider that I don't know anybody here and also that it's shit. Everything is shit. You're so dramatic. I glared into the phone and Tara blinked like she suddenly realized what she'd just said. She groaned and threw her glasses onto her desk, rubbing her eyes. Sorry, you're not dramatic. I just miss you loads. And I'm exhausted. But I know that's not an excuse. I gave her a soft smile. Yeah, well, medical school will do that to you. Ah. She half laughs, dropping her hands and cupping her face. Her mascara was stained under her eyes. I can't wait to see you. Only six days. Yeah, I'm counting down, but I swear this is temporary. I can't stay in this shithole for... It caught my eye from across the room. Tara noticed my distraction immediately. What? I didn't respond, instead standing up to get a better look. Sasha, what is it? It's the bin fucker again, I said under my breath, but of course Tara heard. What? Who's fucking your bins? Are you okay? I turned back to her, rushing over to the window. Behind it, the man scrambled through my bins. I could hear him whining through the glass. That guy who's always at my bins, he's here. I was almost excited to finally have proof. Look, I can show you now. I flipped the phone around from front facing to camera view and pointed it out the window. I heard Tara's shuddering utter of, oh my God, what the fuck? I know. Sasha, that's so creepy, call the police or something. But I was distracted, overcome by more anger. Maybe it was born from the want for Tara to be disgusted while stood by me instead of over the phone. So, I hammered on the window. Hey! Nothing. I watched him swallow a banana peel, slurp it down like spaghetti. Tara made a retching noise. I didn't think. Instead, I grabbed the handle and opened the door. Once I did it, I regretted it almost instantly. But before I could pull the door shut again, he turned around. Normally, his matted, ratty hair covered his face. But even when his hair was pushed away, his expression was obscured by a black balaclava. I saw human eyes bulging and glaring right at me. But what I saw most of was the mouth. Jagged yellow teeth and drool. A bloodied tongue caught between his teeth. There was thick, matted hair coming out of his lips. I'm not stupid, by the way. I wasn't keen on getting a closer look. I shut the door and turned right around, rushing up the stairs and locking myself in my room. Tara tried to calm me down over the next hour before I glanced out the window and made sure that he was gone.
I didn't tell her about the dog man thing. She'd probably just say he was a really committed furry or something. I hoped she was right. I really hoped that that's all it was. 23 11 19 1346. Hey. I stopped in my tracks and turned around. Sam rushed to catch up with me, his ginger hair freshly cut. My initial instinct was to find this odd that he was coming up to me on the street when we barely knew each other. Maybe he was delivering another tart. Hi, I smiled. How have you been? Good. Cool, you okay? His ease darted away, towards my house on the other side of the road. I was ready for this conversation to be over so I could go call Tara and make myself lunch. Sam looked back at me with such confidence in his stare. Dogman was eating your rubbish last night. Nausea crawled into my throat. I was suddenly weak, knees about to buckle, but I tried to keep my tone light. Was he? Yeah. Do you know who Dogman is? I was going to be sick. I think I do, yeah. Sam nodded wisely. He really likes your house. I swallowed, making no more attempt to keep a brave face. Who is he, Sam? Sam shook his head like he was waiting for me to ask that question. He's been here a long time. How long? Long? Sam's words emerged as frosty breath. There was a nearly unbearable pause before Sam seemed to remember something. Oh yeah, my mum wants to invite you over for dinner tomorrow at 7. Would you like to come? I wouldn't. Sure. Tell your mum thanks for me, I'll be there. Sam nodded but didn't skip off immediately. If he tries to hurt you, just treat him like what he is, okay? I couldn't handle it. I pushed away from the conversation and staggered to open my door. I fumbled with the keys, and once I was in, I tried to run to the bathroom, but ended up vomiting onto the floor, like a fucking dog. 24 11 19, 1751. I sobbed over the phone. I can't, Tara. I fucking can't. You can she told me firmly. It's just a day. All this weird shit will pass. I nearly laughed. I just want to leave. I just want to see you. I know, she whispered. I love you, okay? One day. I nodded, choking through my tears. One day. 24, 11, 19, 20, 36. I laughed at the dinner table. There were candles lit on the mantelpiece, and a middle-aged man named Elmer was telling a story. It was hilarious. I was actually having fun, even though all the people in the house were double my age. I was surprised and relieved when I told them about my girlfriend and their only reactions were positive ones. It didn't seem real. Sam sat on the couch, headphones plugged into his laptop. He barely said a word to me all evening, except for a polite, hello again, Sasha, when I arrived. Like we never spoke the day before at all. And maybe we didn't speak. Maybe those hellish months never passed at all. Maybe there was no dog man. 24, 11, 19, 23, 17, he was standing, on two feet like a human, but I could hear him panting like a dog. This wasn't real, it couldn't be. I didn't want this shit in my life. I didn't want a drooling balaclava wearing furry standing in the way of my front door. It was so fucking dark that I could have been imagining it. Maybe if I blinked, he'd be gone but maybe if I blinked, he'd come running at me, snarling and barking and ready to tear me open with yellow dog teeth. I took the risk. I shut my eyes and counted to five. When I opened them, he was gone. I went home and sobbed into my pillow. I waited for Tara, 25 11 19 or 7 29. When I came out of my room, he was stood at the bottom of the stairs. And he didn't just stand, he started walking up the stairs, walking. Couldn't he make up his fucking mind? I just stood there at first, blinking and hoping he'd go away. But he just got closer, and the closer he got, the clearer I could see the balaclava and the matted hair and the collar around his neck. He was wearing a fucking collar. Just treat him like what he is, okay? He was right in front of me. I pointed a finger at him and yelled, Hey! I shouted, No! He froze on the top step, towering over me. No! I barked again. Bad dog, no. He flinched, cowered, whimpered with shiny human eyes. Bad dog, sit, I shouted, jutting a finger at him again. 
He got down on his knees and sat, looking up at me still. Bad dog, I said again. I reached out and wound my fingers around his collar. Come on, come here. I dragged him down the hallway to the bathroom. He crawled on all fours, reluctant with his head hanging low. He whined and whimpered, and I might have thrown up, but I didn't. Not yet. I took the bathroom key in one hand, and with the other, I pushed him forward. He scrambled into the bathroom and then turned around to stare at me with glistening eyes. His disgusting mouth hung open. Stay! I breathed through my mouth. Stay! He stayed. I locked the door from the outside. I ran downstairs and into the street, across the road and banged on Sam's house door. I called the police while shaking and sobbing. A complete mess. I was fawned over by the family, while Sam stood in the kitchen with a hollow expression and remained there no matter how many times his parents told him to go to his room. Hours later, Tara found me in the mess of it all, and this time it was her who cried. Her tears soaked into my shoulder, but I didn't mind. When the police searched my house, they didn't find Dogman, but they still believed me. Apparently, this wasn't an isolated report, as people in the town had complained for a long, long while about a man with a balaclava behaving in disturbing ways. But they had never had a break-in before. That wasn't all their evidence, though. Downstairs, my back door was open. The lock on that thing was always faulty. They found my bathroom completely trashed, everything torn to shreds. The window was smashed and there was blood on the shards of glass. They told me their theory. A mentally ill homeless man had broken into my home in a delusion, having fooled himself into believing that he's a dog. That made more sense to me, and to Tara. We wanted so badly to believe that. But when they tested the blood on the smashed window, it came back as animal blood. Dog blood. I was six years old when I saw the Dogman of Vagreville, and I will never ever forget it. It was on a cool Thursday night in May of 1995. Mom had told me to go to bed, but I wasn't tired yet. I'd snuck my Game Boy under the covers and was playing Mario with the volume off, thinking that I was oh so clever. Mom was probably already in bed and Dad was working late so he wouldn't be in to check on me anytime soon. I knew I could play to my heart's content, and I intended to do just that. My fingers moved clumsily over the buttons as I sent Mario to his death over and over again. I wasn't very good at the game, but it didn't matter. I loved it anyway. I didn't look up from the screen until I heard the distant pop of what sounded like fireworks. I remember that I'd peeked out of the covers, there was no flash of light outside my window, and while it was a beautiful night, there wasn't really any occasion to let off fireworks. All the same, I could still hear those frantic pops, one after the other. Bang, 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 bang. I'd never heard a gun go off before. In movies and on TV, yes, but never in real life. I'd never thought it would sound so much like fireworks. I set my Game Boy down to go and look out the window, half hoping to catch a glimpse of the show I thought was out there. As I looked out into the darkness, though, I saw nothing. Those fireworks had been very close by. I knew that much but I couldn't see anyone who could have set them off. My house was in a small suburb that backed onto the woods, and my window faced the next door neighbor's yard. I could see the lights on in their house, but nothing else. No one was in the yard. I noticed that the door to the back porch was open. No, not open. Shattered. Something had forced its way in, although I didn't quite connect the dots at the time. Then I heard a scream the terrified cry of a frightened woman that was cut off abruptly. That too was close by, and I could tell exactly where that was coming from. It had come from the neighbor's house. I stared at the house, trying to understand just what was going on. There were no other sounds, no other screams, just a pregnant silence. Outside my bedroom, I could hear my mom moving around. She must have heard the same things I had, and I could hear as she raced downstairs to investigate the commotion for herself. She hadn't even made it to the front door when I saw something emerge from the back of the next door neighbor's house. 
It loped through the broken porch door, a scrawny, hairy thing that looked like no animal I'd ever seen before. I could see its pointed ears twitching on its head and its pointed, wolfish snout. Its limbs seemed too long. It seemed to limp as if it was in pain, no doubt from the gunshot wounds it had suffered. Its head turned to look at me, and I saw two golden eyes shining in the darkness. They looked upwards and into my window, where I stared back at it. Whatever that creature was, it looked at me. It saw me. For a moment, our eyes remained locked. Time felt as if it stood still. Even from a distance, I know I saw something in its stare or in its face. But at the time, I couldn't put my finger on it. It was the creature that broke eye contact. It shook its head and shuffled away. Without ceremony, it took off into the woods. The darkness amongst the trees quickly swallowed it whole and I lost sight of it. One moment it was there, the next it was gone. What happened next is a blur. I don't have any other clear memories from that night nor do I remember much about what followed. I'm sure my mom did what she could to shelter me from it. I still found out the details anyways because that's what happens in small towns. People talk and kids listen. While I may not remember what happened after my mom discovered the corpses of Nicholas and Ashley Burr, it was the talk of the town at the time and every now and then. Some people still whisper about it. Vegreville, British Columbia, is a small town with a population that barely tops 3,000 people. Gruesome murders aren't exactly common here, and so when one happens, you'd better believe that people are going to remember it. According to the rumors, some sort of animal broke into the Burr household that night. Most people claim it was a bear, but I've heard some people insist it was a puma. Either way, it woke up Nicholas Burr, and he took down his hunting rifle to kill it. He found it in his kitchen and shot it about six times before it attacked him, and it damn near ripped him in half. Ashley Burr was found upstairs. The creature had gone after her next and ripped her pretty little head clean off her shoulders and crushed it to a pulp. It was shortly afterwards that it ran off. Supposedly, the commotion from concerned neighbors investigating the gunshot and Ashley's final scream spooked it, and it retreated off into the woods. Nobody actually got a good look at it. Nobody but me. Over time, I've taken to calling the creature the Dog Man of Vigreville. Of course, nobody else in town ever actually believed I really saw what I saw. They all took my words as proof that it was a bear, and as I grew up, I learned that it was best not to talk about it. It's easy to forgive a child for claiming he saw something unnatural, but as one ages, that becomes a much less forgivable offense. I never once believed that I'd actually seen a bear that night, though. As I said before, I remember very clearly what I saw. I've seen it in my nightmares for 25 years now, and it sure as hell wasn't a bear. But like I said, I keep that to myself. I'm a grown man now, and I've got other concerns to worry about. I've got rent to pay, a job at the local auto shop to keep, and I've got my mom to take care of. A few months after the Burr incident, my dad's car broke down on the side of a highway while he was on his way home from work one night. He must have been trying to flag down a passing car for help, although the poor bastard whose attention he got didn't notice him until after he'd felt the bump of his body beneath his tires. Dad died instantly, and my mom was never quite the same afterwards. Grief leaves scars on a person that never fully heal, and I had to learn to step up as the man of the house pretty damn quickly after that. I don't believe I've mentioned the Dogman of Vagreville to my mom in a long while. She's got enough on her plate without hearing about my little side project. As age creeps up on her, her health has begun to fail even more. I haven't felt comfortable leaving her by herself. Sickness has left her unable to work, so I handle the bills. She does some of the cooking, but that's really just about it. I'd hate to push her too hard, especially when she's in such a frail state. A few months back, she had her second stroke and it's been a slow recovery process ever since. I do what I can for her, I really do. But no matter how much I want to, I can't fix her. I can't take away the things that are eating her away. And bringing up my research into a local cryptid that I tied to what I know to have been a traumatic incident to her wouldn't do her any favors. It's best left off the table with her. But just because I don't discuss it doesn't mean I haven't put the work in. As I've said, I know what I saw that night, and I've been aiming to prove it for some time now. 
Throughout the years, I researched other attacks in the area. Vegreville only had the one, but I found reports of similar incidents in the surrounding towns. There were a few of them in the late 80s and early 90s. The attacks all played out similarly enough. Some unknown animal suspected to be a bear or puma forced entry into a house and butchered the occupants. Tragic as it was, it got chalked up to a simple animal attack and that was it. You don't often hear of animals forcing entry into houses. Sure, if you look online you'll find funny videos of bears breaking open cabin doors and poking around looking for food. However, those cabins aren't occupied when it happens. I've seen my fair share of bears. They aren't keen on people and generally avoid them when at all possible. Vagreville is a pretty remote place, but it's still far too heavily populated for most bears to want to get too close. Sometimes you might hear about them rummaging through trash or poking around people's yards. I'm sure there have even been a few instances where curious bears broke into houses looking for food. Attacks are rare, however, and when they do happen, they generally involve cubs. People don't care about that, though. There's an image of the bear as this demon of the forest, a violent monster who loves nothing more than to rip into fresh meat. People assume that just because they have the ability to easily kill a person, then they are inclined to do so. Supposedly, three bears were killed in response to the attacks, one in 88, another in 92, and one in 96. The one that died in 96 was a large female grizzly who had attacked a pair of hikers in the next county over. Since the attacks seemed to stop after that, people figured that was the end of it. And I've got to admit, part of me wondered if that really was the case for the longest time. But then the attacks started up again. I saw them on local news stations, the same story as before, forced entry into a house and the total slaughter of its occupants. I knew it was that same creature. I could feel it in my bones and I knew this was my one shot at proving what I'd seen all those years ago. I had no intention of wasting it. The most recent attack occurred in a town called Weston, a few kilometers north of Vigreville. I'd heard about it in the paper, and the next day, I figured I might as well head up to investigate. At worst, I'd waste a day in another town. At best, maybe I might find myself one step closer to understanding just what it was I saw that night. What I knew going in, was that Elsa and Janelle Harris were sisters. Janelle was blind, and Elsa took care of her. One night, something had attacked Elsa while she was in her backyard. Janelle had heard the attack, along with the neighbors, and had gone to the door to call for her. Instead, she'd attracted the attention of whatever animal had killed her sister, and it had dragged her off into the woods. Police had found most of her body the next day. Most of it. The Harris house was in a quiet neighborhood just like my own. I could see the forest behind the houses though. The map said that it wasn't a particularly large stretch of woods. It was little more than a ravine with a small creek that separated the houses from a nearby park. However, it connected with a larger area of the woods. It made for a perfect little place for man and nature to intersect. The house itself was still sectioned off with police tape. I didn't see anyone to stop me from going inside, but I didn't want to push my luck either. Why try it, right? I parked my car across the street and got out. Even if I wasn't going to go inside the house, maybe there were still clues to be found. The houses in that area didn't have fences. Weston was still fairly rural, all things considered. I could get into the backyard easily enough. The vast forest started at the end of the yard and stretched infinitely deep into it. As I walked past the trees, I was quickly swallowed up by the darkness of the canopy. Just what I was expecting to find, I really can't say. I kept my eyes on the dirt in front of me as I circled around to the backyard. Through the trees I could see the yellow police tape, isolating the crime scene that was formerly the Harris's backyard. I didn't go too deep into the woods. It was better not to wander out too deep, or else I'd probably have trouble finding my way back. The area around me was oddly quiet. I could hear a few distant birds and some trickling water, but not much else. Slowly, I approached the water, a small creek that ran over some smooth rocks. I didn't cross the creek. No need to go that far. But I stayed on the edge of it and looked out at the space around me. If the dog man really was the one responsible for this, it would no doubt be long gone. I suppose that was a good thing. I had no interest in meeting that thing face to face. As I stood by the creek, 
my eyes shifted downwards. I'd been half hoping to see something. A footprint. A bit of fur. Hell, maybe even some evidence that Janelle Harris had been dragged that way. I suppose that was my lucky day then. It was faint and easy to miss or mistake for something else. What I say was barely evidence, and yet I saw it all the same. The soil around the creek was wet and muddy. One small segment had grooves in it that indicated something had been dragged that way. A few stones were overturned and had been pulled out of the creek. I paused at the sight of them before I noticed what was right beside those drag marks. A paw print, there was only one. It had landed in the right place at the right time and sank deep into the drying mud. It wasn't even a complete paw print, just a few canine pads that looked only slightly larger than my hand, and yet looking at them gave me pause. I crouched down by the stream, wide-eyed as I studied the indentation in the mud. This was the closest thing I'd gotten to proof since that night 25 years ago, and I immediately took out my phone to grab a picture. You lost, sir? A voice said from behind me as soon as the shutter snapped, and I looked back. A man stood a few feet away from me. He was older, somewhere in his 50s, and dressed in flannel. No, I said hastily as I stood up. Sorry. I was just looking at some tracks. He studied me for a moment before nodding. You with the police? He asked. Not exactly, I replied. Just doing some research. It's something of a hobby. What happened to the Harris girls? It's really tragic. But it reminds me a bit of some attacks that happened about 25 years back. I was just wondering if maybe there was a connection or something. A connection? The other man asked before scoffing. That your car on the street, by the by? The red Corolla? Yeah, that's mine, I said. You must be new in town then, you living in this area? Excuse me? I saw your car the other day. It was your car, right? His brow furrowed. I don't think so. I said, I've never been out here before. I'm just here to look into the killings. The man raised an eyebrow. That's all, huh? My mistake then. You said you found tracks? I nodded before stepping aside to show them to my new companion. He kept his distance from me as he drew nearer and looked down at the indents in the mud. He studied them for a moment before looking back at me. Well, that's interesting. I don't suppose you heard what the police had to say on what happened here, did you? Bear attack, right? I asked. He nodded. They did indeed. You mentioned other attacks in this area. 20, 30 years back, didn't you? I remember those. I suppose this does fit the bill. You ever hear of a man named Tyler Fox? The name wasn't familiar. No, sir, I replied. Well, I was barely even your age when those attacks happened last, so my memory isn't great. If I recall, folks chalked that up to a bear as well. Fox had some other ideas, though. I remember he was working with the police, taking pictures of prints. If I remember, those prints looked a lot like this. If you snapped any pictures, it might be smart to bring them to him. Chances are, he might know something. I looked down at the paw prints once more before looking back at the man. Tyler Fox, you said? I felt something brimming in my chest. Hope or elation, perhaps. If there was evidence from the attacks 25 years ago, maybe it would tell me more about what had been out there back then. Maybe it would tell me more about what was out there now. Where would I find him exactly? I asked, and I barely hid the excitement in my voice as I did. The neighbor gave me an address about 15 minutes away and a phone number to call. Tyler Fox picked up on the second ring, and when I told him I'd found some footprints, he seemed pretty eager to meet. His chosen meeting place was a small diner out on the edge of town. A little greasy spoon, the likes of which you'd probably find just about anywhere, and either served the worst food in the world or the best. No in-between. Fox was a man who was right on the edge of 60 with frazzled gray hair and serious eyes behind big studious glasses. He was waiting for me when I arrived, and I could see his impatience in the way he anxiously drummed his fingers. Mr. Fox? I asked timidly. His gaze locked onto me so fast I was sure he was about to attack. Yes, that would be me. He said hastily, You're the one who called about the paw prints, right? Out behind the Harris house. 
Yes, sir, I found them just this morning. Well, sit down, sit. Let me buy you a drink. I assume you've got the pictures? Right here, sir. I offered him my phone and he snatched it out of my hand to study the pictures on the screen. He was silent for a few moments and a waitress happened by to ask us for our drink orders. Fox had a beer, I opted for soda. A man I spoke to, one of the Harris sisters' neighbors mentioned you'd looked into the attacks a few years back, I said once the waitress was out of earshot. You had some ideas as to what might be causing them? I did, Fox said, his voice distant. He was barely listening to me. After a moment, he set my phone on the table and pushed it back towards me. The cops back then were quick to chalk the attacks up to a bear. Could be that they were right, although I always thought the tracks looked off. Well, those tracks in the picture, I'm no expert, but I don't think those were bear tracks. They could be. He said, the two main theories I've heard floated around are either bears or wolves were responsible for the attacks. Bears have five digits on their paws, just like the tracks you showed me and the size looks just about right. However, if that is a bear, I'll be very surprised. Why is that? I asked. The palm of the tracks. They've got the right amount of digits, but the palm is too wide, like a man's palm. He raised one hand and curled his fingers inwards a little bit to make a claw. Only much bigger. You say you found this out behind the Harris house, right? You swear it? Yeah, yeah, I swear it, I said. Fox huffed. I didn't know if he believed me or not. These look exactly like the tracks I found a few years back. Exactly. Off the top of my head, I'd say this was the same animal. As for what exactly that animal is, well, hell if I know. I take it you're looking into all this. If you were poking around the Harris house, I hesitated for a moment before nodding. That's right. Well, good luck to you. I dug through this shit all those years ago. I never figured out what was really behind those attacks. If you're digging into this, I can send you some of my old photographs and whatnot. I'm a little too old to be trudging about the woods these days, but it might be there's something in there that can help you. Please, I said. I could pick them up today if you're offering. Eager, huh? If you insist, can't say I have much better to do, Fox said with a shrug. He took a long sip of his beer. I'll buy you lunch first, though. Hell, least I can do for the kid who's taking up the torch, right? I'd appreciate that, Mr. Fox. Yeah, you'd better, he chuckled humorlessly before taking another sip. What do you suppose it is? I asked. I know you said you didn't know for sure, but I don't know. What do you think is out there? Like I said, hell if I know. He repeated, if I had to guess, subspecies of something, bear, wolf, I don't know. The woods out here are thick and deep. I've heard people talk of Sasquatch, monsters, demons, and all sorts of strange things. I've never fully bought into all of it. I always figured there was a rational explanation, and that's honestly the best I can come up with. He shrugged. For all I know, it really is Bigfoot out there. Either way, it's killing those people and clearly it's back. The waitress who'd brought us our drinks returned with a friendly smile and a charming greeting of, Have you boys decided what you'd like to eat? Yeah, I'll go with the Salisbury steak, Fox said, without even looking at the menu, and the waitress looked expectantly at me. I hadn't had a chance to go through the menu either, and with the way her eyes lit up with recognition, I didn't get a chance either. Oh, it's you, she said, half surprised and half relieved. She said it as if we'd met before, although I was sure I'd never seen that woman before in my life. You look a lot better today, don't you? Excuse me, I asked. Oh, don't you remember? You were pretty out of it. It was, oh, what, a few days back? You were on the side of the road. We gave you a ride. I stared at her, unsure just what the hell she was saying, and yet her smile held a sincerity to it that was difficult to argue. You don't remember? She repeated. Sorry, ma'am. I'm afraid you have the wrong person, I said quietly. Fox was looking at me expectantly, one eyebrow raised, and I saw a dejected look cross the waitress's face. She was probably wondering if she'd either really got it wrong or if I was trying to save face and she'd embarrassed me. Oh, well, maybe I do, she said quietly. I'm sorry. That must have been my mistake. Sorry about that. No worries. I assured her and forced an uncomfortable smile. 
I guess I've just got one of those faces. I guess you do, she repeated, trailing off slightly before taking a step back. She offered a sheepish smile and left without even taking my order. Another waitress conveniently came along to take it after I'd had a chance to look at the menu. Fox never asked me about what she'd said. I suppose he took it at face value and opted to stay out of it either way. I was grateful for that much. When I left Weston, I had an old box filled with old photographs of paw prints in mud. Fox had been generous in what he'd given me, and I couldn't get home to pour over it all fast enough. I'd stumbled upon the motherload of dogman evidence, not enough to truly convince anyone, no, it would take a hell of a lot of proof to ever really be enough, but it was enough for me. I faked sick and took the next day off work just to pour over the photographs and files. Fox had just about everything, including detailed reports of every suspected encounter with whatever creature he thought was behind this. In a 100 kilometer radius of Vegreville, I counted about 12 different supposed attacks from 1990 to 1996, including the Burr family. There were photographs and even one or two plasters of footprints taken from the scene, but not much in regards to eyewitnesses. Nobody had clearly seen what had attacked those people, and the best information I could find was people describing it as an animal fleeing the scene. It was more information than I'd ever had access to, but nothing definitive. At least the pictures of the prints were enough for me to compare to the pictures I'd taken. Fox had been right when he'd said they'd been similar. However, looking at them side by side, I couldn't help but feel as if the one I'd found was smaller than the one Fox had photographed. I supposed it made some sense. After all, after so many years, it probably wasn't the exact same creature, right? This one could be a juvenile. Maybe even the offspring of whatever had begun the attacks, which posed a question. What had triggered the attacks this time? Why had they stopped? What were they starting again? I saw no real answers, nothing to explain why any of this was happening, and that question hung uncomfortably over me. It was only a few days later that I heard news of another attack. My digging into what Fox had given me hadn't led me to any shocking new revelations. However, I knew I couldn't turn down the chance to look into another attack. So recent too, I remember waking up that morning and coming downstairs to see the news on the TV. Mom was watching it intently, dead silent as she did. I remember her eyes fixated me for a moment, studying me more intently than normal. I offered her a comforting smile as I went over to join her. Did you eat yet? I asked. I can make some breakfast if you haven't. No, no, I'm fine. She rasped and looked back at the TV. She didn't comment on what she was watching, but she didn't need to. I could see the recognition in her eyes as the anchor recounted the same story I'd heard before. Something had entered the house of someone in Vegreville. It had left no survivors. Once I was sure that mom would be okay on her own for a few hours, I headed out to the neighborhood where the attack had happened. I kept my distance, of course, and parked my car just down the street. I could see flashing police sirens and yellow tape blocking the area off. No way I was going to get close to it, and I wasn't quite interested in trying my luck. I could see a few neighbors speaking to the officers and dared to let myself creep closer. Maybe if I couldn't go in, I could at least ask a few questions. One of the cops looked up at me as I drew nearer. He'd been talking to one of the neighbors, a middle-aged man I'd seen around town from time to time. He stared at me as if I was a ghost. I just chalked it up to shock. Morning, officer, I said calmly and casually as I could. What happened here? I'm not at liberty to discuss that, the officer said, his tone stern. He looked me up and down, his brow furrowing. I've been asked not to let people linger around the crime scene. Best you go home, let us do our work. Of course, of course, sorry, I said, faking a smile. I could see the neighbor he'd been talking to still staring at me brow furrowed in what looked to be anger. The man looked at the officer, then back to me. Our eyes met for a moment before he spoke. You... I saw you last night. The officer paused and looked over at the man. He drew closer to me. I remember the car. I remember you. You're the one I saw heading into their backyard. Excuse me? I asked. 
Going into these people's backyard? Was this guy crazy? No, no, it was you, the man insisted. He looked at the officer now. That's the guy I was talking about. That's the guy I saw going into the backyard. He'd started raising his voice and the commotion had drawn another officer. I took a step back, and as the man kept shouting, time seemed to become a blur. Okay, sir, were you present here last night? I remember the officer asking. No, I said, no, I don't usually go down this street. I was home all last night, you could ask my mom. I saw you, asshole, don't you dare fucking lie, the neighbor spat. I saw your shit-ass car on the street and I saw you going into their backyard. I saw it and I've got it on my porch camera. It wasn't me, I cried, I wasn't here last night. I can prove it, asshole. The man was in my face then, eyes locked to mine and screaming. I remember the officer stepping between us, although his posture suggested he was trying to protect the man screaming at me rather than the other way around. In my peripheral vision, I saw two other officers watching me. They seemed too close for comfort. Sir, would you mind coming down to the station? He asked. His voice indicated that I didn't have much of a choice. We just want to ask you a few questions. My mouth suddenly felt dry. I could feel my pulse racing, but I still forced myself to say yes. I'd been at home all night. There was no way it was me that man had seen last night, was there? At the station, I watched the footage of my own car parking on the street outside what I now knew to be the home of Leon and Taylor Baker, along with their two sons. I could see myself clearly on that footage walking into their backyard. Not a man who looked like me, me. And I couldn't come up with a single reason why I'd been on that film to the stony-faced detective I'd been in the room with. All I could do was sputter incompetently as he sighed and placed me under arrest. As I was led to a holding cell, I felt like I was in a dream state, ready to wake up at any second. What was happening didn't feel like reality anymore. I felt like I was drifting through something strange and incomprehensible. As I laid down on the cot they'd provided me, listening to drunkards in the next tank over, my heart was still pounding. My blood was racing so loud, I could feel it in my ears. I don't remember falling asleep. I'm not sure if I really did fall asleep. I woke up at home about an hour ago. I don't know how much time I've got. I've seen the news about the police station. Apparently someone recently escaped one of the holding cells and left eight officers dead in their wake. That someone wasn't named. And yet the way my mom looked at me when I came downstairs said enough. Her lips were sealed tight and silent tears streamed down her cheeks as I stood at the bottom of the stairs staring at the TV. I looked over at her and watched as she continued to cry. I'm sorry, was all she managed to say. I thought you'd be different than your father. I thought that when he died, this would all be over. I know you didn't mean to do any of it. I know that. He didn't either. It's just that work could be so stressful for him, and when the stress came, it came out. I stared quietly at her, watching her bury her head in her hands. My whole body was trembling. It, I asked her. The wolf in him, it's in you too. He never could control it. Oh God, God, I'm sorry. I didn't know how to tell you. I didn't think you'd believe it was you. I, I didn't know what to do. I, her final words were cut off into empty sobs and I quietly withdrew back up the stairs. But I don't know if I fully understand what's been happening to me. I realize now that there are gaps in my memory. Things I did that I can't remember. Things I don't think I want to remember. I can hear the police sirens getting closer. I know I don't have much time. I'll try and go peacefully. But I don't know if whatever is in me, whatever was in control during those hours I can't remember, will go without a fight. I think I'm gonna die soon. I don't know. I don't know much anymore, but there is one thing I'm sure of. I think I found the Dogman of Vegreville, when I think that it's me. This all started three years ago when we first moved from a big city to a small town in Michigan. After living in Detroit my whole life, the small town, or more accurately, the huge forest that surrounds my house, 
is eerie at times. I always chalked most of it to the fact that I've always been a horror junkie with an active imagination. Until I started seeing things. I know sounds typical, right? Spooky fog and deep woods. A teenager all alone with only their small mutt and smaller chihuahua for protection. I guess that's why I never said anything anytime something happened. It's getting harder to ignore now though. My first year here I always had trouble sleeping. I blamed it on the neighbor's rescue dogs and the deer. Anything that seemed logical, I was desperate. Even more so after my fist Michigan storm. There was a thick layer of snow and a thicker layer of fog. My little mud of a dog, my baby really, was outside, and I was trying to get him in before the snowstorm hit hard again. He thankfully ran in, we don't have a fence, and he runs free before he saw it. I'm still not sure what it was. It looked like a wolf the size of a beer and was slowly walking from my neighbor's barn to the woods we owned. I brush it off as a bobcat or maybe a coyote who grew crazy big. It was my fist winter and the first time I'd seen a wild animal other than deer, so to me it made sense. I was stupid. The rest of the year followed smoothly with me growing used to the heavy breathing-like sound that the deer made and never seeing that dog thing again. The next year was when shit got bad. I had biology and we were watching some type of documentary when a sub was in. And that's when I heard it. A buck snort. A proper one. The scary part. Is, it wasn't what I'd been hearing the past year. This sound was sharp and distinct. It wasn't the soft yet heavy breathing that had been sounding like it had been pressed right on my window. I was scared. No terrified. Whatever that sound I'd been hearing, it wasn't from a deer. I don't know what it was from. I started looking for odd things. Things that might let me figure out what was lurking behind my house. I noticed paw prints in my dirt driveway throughout the year. I pointed them out to my brother once, not saying much about them, hoping that he'd brush it off as my love of dogs. He claimed that they must belong to the neighbor's rescue mastiff. That soothed me and my fears. It explained everything, more or less, so I let myself believe it. Why did I keep letting myself not see what was in front of me? As the year went on, I hung out with my brother and his friends. They were cool, and we'd all play video games together. It was all fine until one of his friends reviled one of his favorite interests. Horror stories. More accurately, urban legends, his favorite being that of the Michigan Dog Man. Look it up if you don't believe me, I didn't believe him. But it's a legend often spread in the youth of small towns in Michigan. The Dog Man is a large creature much like a werewolf but bigger and harder to trace. He is intelligent and stalks his prey long before he catches it. A master of disguise and morbid monster. I still keep shrugging at
facility and general construction, lying in a shallow ditch near the spot where I'd planned on taking my own life. The ground around it was disturbed, as if sometime during the previous night, its owner had struggled to superficially bury it before being dragged away. There was a great swath etched away in the dirt to suggest and support this conclusion. Aside from the dirt, there were a few stains on the surface of the journal, and more than one page was covered with, or stuck to another by, dark splotches, presumably blood. Darkly intrigued, I decided to forestall my self-destruction and left the woods with it in my possession. I've always enjoyed reading, especially the journals and stories of people who've endured terrible or chaotic events, and my curiosity was no less potent at that moment, despite my resolution to die. Thankfully, I hadn't announced my suicide, directly or subtlety, to anyone, and was able to return to my home without having to explain myself or dismiss worries. I read the journal once, and then when my nerves returned to me and I'd finished pacing around my bedroom, I read it again, this time with a morbid fascination. I've now decided to copy the entries, word for word, onto my computer in a document and will be uploading them online so that this person's tragic, grisly, and terrifying story can be shared with the world. They cannot do it themselves, and having found the journal, it's now my duty to give voice to their tragedy. It is a long story, so I will relate it in parts. I can only copy so much at a time before becoming filled with anxiety and a sympathetic terror. There seem to be a few entries missing, most notably in the beginning, where the person's story seems to pick up in the middle of the horrific experience. Later on, they make vague suggestions of the nightmare's origin, but the first entry is merely a recounting of the terror after it had already emerged. So, without further delay, here is the first entry. It must have stalked me for hours before I even noticed it. Once I realized I was being hunted, the signs were hard to miss. The scattering of animals ahead of me, despite my light-footed navigation. The eerie silence they left in their wake, broken only by a faint, never-too-far-away howl. The feeling, that evolutionarily ingrained animal sense of imminent danger, of something tracking me. When I reached the river, my instincts told me to cross it, but there was nothing but darkness on the other side. The woods there were utterly untraversed. It was obvious that no one had ever gone that far into this particular area of the wilderness. There were no guide signs, no paths, no warnings. It was immediately foreboding and suggested perils far worse than just getting lost in the woods. Common sense told me to follow the river, to hope that I'd come across other people, some structure or fixture of civilization. For the first time in a while, I ignored common sense and followed my vaguer instincts. Leaping into the river, I dashed across and quickly mounted the opposite bank. I wanted to immediately push forward into the tree line, but that primal sense of self-preservation told me to look back, impelled me to see my pursuer, so that I'd later be able to identify and avoid him. I was then somehow certain that a conflict was imminent, that I'd have to face off against him, against it, dripping wet, with the moon hovering dismally amidst dark clouds just above me, I turned back toward the part of the woods from which I'd come, and standing there in clear view, highlighted in an errant ray of moonlight, was the thing that had been chasing me for hours, the dogman. He was nude from the waist down and his body, intimidatingly muscular, shone in the moonlight, the sweat falling thickly from his corded muscles. But the most awful thing about him the thing that sent me spinning and running headfirst into that dense, nylightless part of the woods was his head. It wasn't a human head, but a dog's. The skull shape, face and ears, all unmistakably canine. The nostrils flared in his pronounced snout. The jaws hung open, exhaling a thick vapor and slavering disgustingly. Only the eyes, uncannily blue, showed any semblance of humanity in that unreal, monstrously incongruous visage. As I sped past and through the underbrush, I heard a howl, long and malignant, echo skyward. And almost automatically, my pace quickened when I realized that the howl was not dying out, but growing closer. I've never been a particularly unlucky person, but I can say that the incident that occurred shortly after my flight into the denser part of the wood was one of the unluckiest moments any human being has ever experienced. Through some sort of sixth sense or re-emergent animal intuition, 
I'd effortlessly and thoughtlessly leapt over loose vines, rocks, and other ground-level obstacles during the first few minutes of my run. But abruptly veering to my right to avoid a tree, I came face to face with an owl. Of all things, mid-flight. It flew right into my face, shrieked madly, and sent me careening to the ground with the force of the collision and the mad flutter of its wings. Dizzied, I watched it arc toward a tree and perch itself upon a branch, where it then began to hoot loudly and obnoxiously, as if meaning to spitefully alert the dogman of its interaction with me. Before I had completely risen to my feet and brushed myself off, I heard the approaching, the heavily pounding, footsteps of the dogman. I also heard his breathing, hard and bestial, and this sent me running off again, still a bit disorientated from my jarring collision with that stupid bird. I didn't have to run for long because after a few more dips and dodges, I came upon the mouth of a cave. Knowing that I'd soon have to stop to rest, and not wanting to do so out in the open, in his territory, I sprinted into the cave. The moon's light only reached a few feet into the interior, and then there was just total blackness beyond that. I slowed and extended my hands out sideways so that I could feel along the walls, which were fairly narrow. The walls and the floor were dry, and more than once I felt my hands slip across the silken threads of some spider's, hopefully, abandoned trap. Eventually, after what seemed like an hour of slow and downwardly angled trudging, I sensed the space ahead of me open up. There was a perceptible vastness about the darkness before me, and as I continued on, my hands abruptly lost contact with the walls. Dropping them, I strode a little more surely ahead, confident that I had entered some sort of subterranean chamber. There were a few faint sounds high above me, though nothing sounded or echoed with any degree of clarity. I heard nothing behind me and felt somewhat relaxed. The dogman seemed to have lost my trail. Now that things had calmed down, common sense then returned to me, demanding an audience, and I remembered that I had a phone. Before, my mind had been entirely focused on escape. No other thoughts but that singular impetus towards immediate survival had been formed. But now, standing in that lightless, curiously open space beneath the woods, I was able to think a little clearer. I pulled my phone out of my pocket, checked the reception, no signal, and turned on the flashlight feature. Sweeping the beam across the cave chamber's floor, I mostly saw a strangely smooth, though definitely earthen surface, occasionally blemished by dark, unidentifiable stains. There were no objects that I could immediately see, though there were small amorphous piles. It was hard to tell if they were collections of dust, ash, or clumps of fur. Not wanting to disturb them and leave evidence of my presence, I gave each little pile a wide berth where I could and continued on further into the chamber. My light held out before me. Shining it up to the ceiling showed nothing, only a skyward gulf of blackness that my phone's light couldn't hope to overcome. Keeping it level with my vision brought the same results, though I was happy that I could at least navigate without fear of suddenly walking into a wall or off a precipice. Eventually, my foot struck against something and I froze. The sound of the object skittering across the surface echoed audibly throughout the cavernous expanse. Not a moment later, I heard a distant, inhumanly sustained howl and realized with a sudden spike of terror that it had come from the mouth of the cave. Panicking, I swept my flashlight across the cave floor and eventually found the object, a leather-bound journal. Scooping it up so that I wouldn't again kick it, I then hurried further on, desperate to find some place to hide. My light bobbed back and forth, falling only on the perpetually flat, unexplainably smooth floor. All the while from behind and growing closer, I heard that monster's ungodly shriek. Just when the howls seemed to enter and deepen in the chamber, becoming even more terrible in their suggestions of bestial insanity, my light fell upon a small mound of fractured rocks, a boulder that perhaps had fallen from some higher position years or even decades before. I turned off my light and crouched behind it. Not a second later, I heard the patter of bare feet on rock and the semi-human breathing of the dogman. I listened motionlessly, whilst praying that my quickening heartbeat would not be heard by the beast. It seemed to sniff around for a moment, and I prayed that the sheer spaciousness of the room would serve to make the detection of my scent a little harder for it. After a few more moments of searching, it apparently gave up. 
the sounds of its scent-seeking nostrils were replaced by a strange, hoarsely guttural cachination, as if it had heard a sick joke or witnessed something morbidly funny. It went on for a few moments, then stopped as abruptly as it had started. After this, there was only a heavy, tension-filled silence, during which I imagined the creature stealthily stalking around the chamber in a renewed search of its prey. But after the passage of what couldn't have been less than 10 minutes, there was still only silence, and I ventured to peek around the rock's corner. Though the room was dark, I could still see the vague figure of the dogman and almost scream it aloud at the sight of him, only a few feet away. He was crucheted, with his arms across his chest so that the hands rested on the opposite shoulder, with his abominable head held down. It's a posture that suggested sleep or a gesture of reverent contemplation. Against both instinct and common sense, I held out my hand and twiddled my fingers, desiring to know if it were truly asleep. When it didn't react to my baiting activity, a great weight seemed to lift from me. I didn't move from my hiding place, but allowed my body to relax a little. Using the light of my phone screen, not the flashlight function itself, I then examined the journal and found its pages entirely empty. There were no hints as to how it had come to lie on the floor of the cave, but it was obviously old. There was a smell of earth and agedness about it. And someone had apparently desired to use it at some point. An ink pen was taped to the back of it. Despite the dogman's strange and sudden dormancy, I knew that it would be suicide to try and sneak past it. Neither did I want to venture deeper into the cave, where who knows what other horrors might lie. So, for now, I've decided to record what's happened to me in the journal, writing by the light of my phone. Its battery is at 40%, so I should have enough to last the night. And hopefully, by morning, the dogman will have gone back out, or go deeper into the cave, which I suspect is his lair. I don't dare to sleep. I'm sure a wave of tiredness will soon come to me, but I'll just have to fight it. I do not want to die, certainly not at the hands of that unholy cross-species creature. I'm currently hiding in a small natural alcove in the lower chamber's rearmost wall, penning what I fear may be my final entry, despite only being my second. The cave floor is a few feet below me, a small drop, but to drop down would nonetheless be a death sentence because the floor is littered with human bones. There is absolutely no way I can drop down quietly, and it is just beyond the entrance to this chamber, conducting some strange, though unquestionably obscene ritual before the altar beside the chamber's entrance. I saw the altar earlier during my hasty descent into the subterranean chamber of the greater cave system. The altar is a crude thing, an oblong mound of rock over which the hide of an animal, I hope an animal, is tautly stretched. And atop this were several crude artifacts, all made of bone and other materials salvaged from once living creatures. There were other objects, what might have been candles, but I didn't stop to closely examine them. The dogman had just awoken, and against my earlier fears, he began making his way deeper into the cave, rather than out of it. It was only by luck, some momentary lapse of sanity on his part, that I managed to scurry further into the cave. When I saw him tilt his head to the side, as if to listen closely to some unseen speaker, I left my hiding place, carrying the journal and pen in my hands, and fled toward the oval of slightly greater darkness at the end of the cavernous chamber the entrance to a tunnel, which eventually led down into what I suppose I should call the Ritual Room. Seeing the recent activity here, bloodstains not faded enough for my liking, clumps of gristle, the half-gnawed limbs of deer and other animals, I hurriedly continued on, hoping to find another passageway. There was one, in the back of the abysmal room, and it led down into a small, featureless, and thankfully goreless room. It is here that I've hidden myself. I wasted no time in climbing up onto the little shelf in the wall and rolling in. The journal and pen tucked close to my body. I waited for what felt like hours before turning on my phone's light. I heard the dogman begin conducting his strange, bestial, indescribably odd-sounding rites. There were periods of guttural shouting and others of a mad, psychotic bleeding, as if a goat had been ensnared stricken mad by some animally incomprehensible horror and encouraged by torture to shriek out its agonies. But despite how terrifying these frequently alternating phases 
were the fewer and shorter periods of a deep, darkly reverent silence were even worse. It was during these that I turned off my light, for fear of being detected, even though I hadn't felt any such vulnerability during the aforementioned cycles of audible insanity. When at last the wickedly ceremonial sound stopped for good, and the subsequent silence stretched on longer than it had before, I climbed out of the alcove, crept up the incline, and peered into the room. I allowed myself only the briefest glimpse before running on tiptoe back down and returning to my claustrophobic sanctuary. As I've already mentioned, there is an altar up there, a slab of rock, over which is draped the stretched and dried skin of some animal, with several savage, ritualistic trinkets lying atop its surface. What I hadn't noticed during my initial flight through the room was the object affixed to the rightmost wall when facing the entrance into the larger sanctuary beyond, and decorated with strips of flesh and hair and other grisly fixtures. There is a very large and semi-complete reproduction of the Dogman, an upscaled image of itself, built of many bones, with a multiform head, the various canine features having been taken from several different dogs and wolves, and near seamlessly stitched together to form a single, monstrously composite head. I'd never seen something so boldly, blatantly horrific, so suggestively satanic, and immediately removed myself from its abhorrent, though thankfully inanimate, presence. Back in my little hidey hole, I tried to think of what purpose the towering idol could possibly serve to a thing that seemed not just helplessly insane, but perfectly content with being the only one of its kind. It had obviously shown its hatred for other creatures of a natural order, the evidence being the viscera, bones, and flesh left lying carelessly about the altar room, and so I was left stumped, unable to imagine why it would construct such a loathsome, supersized replica of itself, if not for sick, inanimate companionship. My thoughts were interrupted, fortunately or unfortunately, for you to decide, by the return of the dogman, who had apparently gone out to do a little post-ritual hunting and was now back. I heard the unmistakable sounds of bodies being dropped onto the stony floor, and even more horribly, the pitiful, weak-willed cries for mercy of the people the creature had captured. These pleas were quickly, cruelly snuffed out. There was a series of thuds, and I assumed that the creature had clobbered them over their heads with a rock. This macabre assumption served to both magnify my terror and chill my very soul, so that not even my quickening heart could reheat or re-elevate my frigid and ever-plummeting spirit. There were a few more sounds, so horrible in their suggestions of bloody violence that I refused to devote the pen strokes to describe them. And then the profane, intermittently modulating ritual sounds played out again, the guttural shouting, the insane feral bleeding, the deathly, unbearably cryptic silence. And then when I thought the creature would again return to the outside world for some other diabolic purpose, there instead came the sounds of objects rolling down the incline into my sanctuary. At first, I thought that the creature had simply discarded the object he'd used to club the helpless victims. But upon leaning over the edge of my shelf, I saw the ivory crown of a freshly scalped head, still glistening in the eerie cave light that had during the ritual eerily arisen.
but it was as if the creature had vanished into thin air. One night, as they sat around the campfire discussing their next move, they heard a blood-curdling howl in the woods. They knew they had found their target. But where? That sent a chill down their spines. They quickly packed up camp and set out to track the howl. As they followed the howl deeper into the woods, the trees grew thicker and the darkness more intense. They knew that they were getting close. Suddenly, they came across a clearing, and in the center of the clearing stood the beast. It was even more terrifying than the legends had described. It stood on its hind legs, towering over the hunters, and its glowing red eyes locked on its prey. Each of the men stood, despite each of them being hardened men, ones that had seen the likes of vile and rabid game. They had never before seen something so terrifying, so gargantuan, so tyrannical as the dogman that stood before them now. They could feel each of them, this thing's burning red eyes peering straight through their corneas, straight through their brains and into their hearts. That's it, said Jack, his heart pounding in his chest. That's the dogman. The hunters raised their weapons and prepared to fire, but the dogman was too fast. With lightning speed, it charged at them, its razor-sharp teeth bared, ready to rent flesh from bone, without even a single worry of them dolling. The hunters fired, but their bullets seemed to have no effect on the creature. We have to take it down now, Jack shouted. The hunters fought bravely, but they were no match for the dogman. It was far too strong, far too fast, and just far too ferocious. Jack was thrown into the ground, and he thought that it was the end for him. He watched as two of his other companions had been slammed into a tree, instantly crushing their skulls to paste. The third, oh the third. Jack watched in horror as he, all he could do, as the dogman lifted the poor bastard by his head and ripped it clean from his shoulders, dowsing the both of them in warm metallic crimson. Jack had all but given up hope. There was nothing he could do. His men were dead, and the dogman would have him next. The dogman approached, the ground quaking in fear with every step he took forward. Snarling, the dogman opened its mouth. Suddenly, Jack remembered something his grandfather had told him. He remembered the legend of the dogman and how it may be defeated, for, like many creatures of native lore, they all bore a very distinct weakness to silver. With a surge of strength, Jack rose to his feet and pulled out a silver knife. The dogman turned to face him, snarling defiantly, and Jack plunged the knife into its heart with a furious roar. The creature let out a blood-curdling howl and fell to the ground, dead. Jack stood, adrenaline forcing his heart to thump and pound in his chest, harder than it ever could. We did it, Jack said, his voice shaking with emotion. The town is saved. He returned to Ravenswood as a hero. He was greeted with cheers and congratulations from the townspeople. Jack went to see the mayor to report what had happened. Jack, oh God, Jack, I can't thank you enough, the mayor said, a look of relief plastered on his face. The dogman has been terrorizing our town for too long. You've saved us all. It was my pleasure, sir, Jack replied grimly. But I couldn't have done it without the help of my men. God rest their souls. The mayor nodded. You're right. This is a team effort. They were brave men who gave their lives. And I want to make sure that everyone is recognized for their bravery. I will be holding a town meeting tomorrow to present medals of honor to you and holding a commemorative memorial to the rest of your team. Jack couldn't believe it. He had never thought of himself as a hero, but to the town he now was. He felt a sense of pride and accomplishment wash over him. But their victory was short-lived, as they soon realized that the Dogman was not the only creature terrorizing the town. The legend of the werewolf was also true, and it had been seen recently in the forest. Jack knew he would have to act fast before it does any real harm to the town. He set out again into the forest to hunt the werewolf. This time, he was better prepared, and he had silver bullets on hand for when the inevitable time would come to face down the beast. He searched for days, but the werewolf was elusive. The werewolf was far more aguile than the dogman before him. One night, he sat around the campfire pondering his next move, when just as with the dogman, hauntingly familiar to him, a blood-curdling howl echoed through the forest. It was even more terrifying than anything he ever heard. It was a howl that would have even made the dogman before shudder. 
and before he even knew what was happening, its eyes, its burning yellow eyes were fixed upon him. The young hunter, the hero, raised his weapon and fired, but the werewolf was far too fast, bounding from treetop to treetop. From one, it bounded like a panther towards him, with its teeth and claws bared. He fired his silver bullets. After a few, perhaps three or four misfires, his aim came true, and the werewolf let out a final howl before crashing to the ground dead. Jack felt a sense of relief wash over him. He had finally put an end to another terror that had plagued the town. He looked at it, and he looked back towards the town, imaging the same relief in the eyes of the townspeople. He had done it once again. And as he made his way back to the town, he was once again greeted as a hero. The town threw a huge celebration in his honor, and once more the mayor presented him with a medal of honor. Jack felt a sense of pride and accomplishment, but as he looked around at the townspeople, he couldn't help but feel a twinge of sadness. He knew that this was not the end. There would be other monsters out there, lurking, other battles he would have to fight. But for now, he was content to bask in the glory of his victory. As days went by, Jack became known as the Monster Hunter of Ravenswood. He was called upon whenever there was any kind of creature and kind of behemoth monstrosity terrorizing the town. And he always answered the call, ready to face whatever gargantuan behemoth that plagued the town. In the years that followed, Jack faced many challenges, but he would always emerge victorious. He became a legend in his own right, and his tea, no doubt it had received immaculate care. The patios were spotless, the hot tub clean and large, the glass didn't have a single smear or spot on it. It was only one level, but it was very large from the outside. I noticed Dakota was staring into the trees and keeping himself unusually quiet. Not to your liking? I inquired. It's only a little bit different from BC, Dakota hummed. But it's nice. It'll be good to relax here. Both of them were intelligent, but a bit snobby to a fault. They weren't the easiest to impress, but they both looked out for me. And in turn, I valued their friendship and kept them included in my events. A stiff wind sent chills down my spine, and I could tell Nick and Dakota both felt the cold too. Let's go inside, I suggested, getting chilly. The inside was just as extravagant as the outside. The amount of space each area had was on par with miniature mansions. There was a fireplace, lots of couches, and each bed there was a king-sized one, a definite upgrade from my queen-sized bed at home. The three of us called dibs on the first rooms, and I was satisfied with my view of a few mountains that the sun would perfectly set between at night. Not only that, the pantry was chocked full of all sorts of non-perishable food. Funny. I didn't see anything about food being given to us. I told everyone to pack accordingly, so we were going to be filled up in no time. Thumping could be heard in the distance, which alerted me. You guys hear that too, hey? I asked Nick. He chuckled. I think the rest of your friends are here. I peeked out the window as the thumping got louder. He was right. The thumping was coming from the music that Xander, Brandon, and CJ were listening to in CJ's SUV. I could hear them bellowing with enthusiasm from here, hands swinging wildly out of the windows as CJ parked. Are you ready to feel how old we are? Dakota asked Nick. I'm thankful I brought some earplugs, Nick answered. Should help with these fucking loons. Come on guys, you're not that much older than them, I cooed. What, five years? Nick and Dakota had just celebrated their 30th birthdays two months ago. My 24th was coming up in a week so this was like a pre-party for that. The other three matched my age. I hopped out of the cottage to greet the others. I hope you brought your A-game and a whole lot of alcohol, I announced, arms open. Holy shit, this place is nice, CJ gasped, stepping out of the SUV. Brandon and Xander didn't say much, but gave me a pleasant nod as they hauled their coolers inside. Didn't get swindled, can't find a flaw here yet, I said, breathing in the fresh air and doing a 360 of my surroundings. I'm a little cold, though. CJ checked his arms, the hair standing upwards on them. He brooded a little. Wasn't it supposed to be hot this weekend? Yeah, I know, but hey, at least we have a hot tub. Shit, ain't that the truth? He went inside with the others. There was a definite difference in my two age groups. 
Dakota and Nick spent much of their time on the first day smoking weed and reading at the back patio. Xander and Brandon spent much of their time drinking heavily and getting rowdy with each other. They recently had an issue of liking the same girl, who I invited but couldn't attend, who ultimately chose Xander. I noticed them getting into a shoving match and I held back Xander. CJ got on Brandon. I don't want to play bouncer with you guys, wasn't this shit behind you guys? I said, still holding on to Xander. He was no match, and CJ was easily overpowering Brandon. Yeah, but this asshat keeps saying how bad of a fuck I am to her. Xander answered with a labored voice. Nin it's cause you are, man. Kelly deserves someone who can last more than a minute. Brandon barked back. Who the fuck cares about that? We're here to have a good time. CJ said, giving an extra squeeze on his hold. There was a moment of silence apart from the music that was playing in the living room. We both let go of our squabbling friends, and Brandon left in a huff. I'm going for a walk, don't let Rasputin there follow me unless he wants a beating, Brandon yelled, flipping off Xander. Xander stroked his lengthy beard and scoffed. I couldn't help but chuckle. Brandon's description of Xander was accurate. Hey, you shouldn't be going alone, I called out, but it fell on deaf ears. I sighed, leaving the living room to join Dakota on the patio outside. Dakota offered me a joint, and I gladly accepted it. As I lit it up with him, he gestured over to something I didn't notice while I was inspecting the place before. It was a sign that had been nailed above the door I had just walked out of. Extreme caution. Do not go out alone at night, they will find you. I read aloud. I turned back to Dakota. What do you think they are? Dakota shrugged. Bears, maybe? It's the pre-hibernation season, after all. Didn't mention it in the ad, did they? I took a look at the sun. It was about three hours before it'd be noticeably dark out. Nick joined the two of us and lit up a joint as well. Where were you? Dakota asked. In my room trying my hardest not to laugh at Jay's shit friends go at it. Nick sneered. I rolled my eyes. I pondered between my drags, the sign weighing on my mind. Think I should look for Brandon? I finally asked, breaking the silence. Nah, he'll be fine. The trails here don't stretch long according to the map, Nick said. Let him have his boo-hoo and he'll be back soon enough. The two older guys always kept me a little grounded, and I was grateful for it. I noticed things were back to normal after I peeked into the window. Xander and CJ were gaming and laughing like they normally do. Two hours had passed and Brandon still hadn't returned. I pulled up the ad for the cottage, and nothing in the description had mentioned the sign anywhere. Not even the owners mentioned it in the ad. I sat at the table stirring my dark and stormy I made for myself glaring at the ad. I must have been glaring hard because Xander slowly approached me, seating himself. Everything all right, man? He asked me. I postured myself up, snapping out of my thoughts. Yeah, just weirded out by that sign outside looking at the ad and there's not a goddamn thing. Concerned about Brandon going off on his own, you know? Xander raised an eyebrow. A sign? I gestured over to the back entrance, and he went to read it, and came back to me. That's awfully weird, he said. Good thing it's just Brandon. But he contributed, man. He's a friend, too. But now I'm nervous that they are going to find me if I go out looking for him, I worried. I'm just trying not to think about it. Xander gave me an assuring pat on the back. How about you don't think about it and come play some games with CJ and your old folks? I chuckled and proceeded to play some beer pong with the rest of them. Another hour passed, and the five of us piled into the hot tub together. We had all drank ourselves into losing track of time, and I had completely forgotten about Brandon. The sun was basically set, and the view of the stars had me in awe. We had all gotten to shooting the shit when CJ piped up. Where's Brandon? He back yet? There was a pause. I took a deep breath. Brandon! I shouted out, my voice echoing into the mountain range. I shouted some more. Brandon, 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 Brandon L. Lawrence, get over here. CJ called out into the rocks and trees. We heard what sounded like a warped echo of CJ's voice in the distance. I raised an eyebrow at that, but assumed it was the distance CJ's mighty voice carried. Well, if we're smart, unlike Brandon there, we should be inside by now. Dakota suggested. 
keep one of the doors unlocked for him, I guess. A heavy cold breeze hit all of us. It even made the hot tub feel like an ice bath. We all flinched, getting ourselves back into the cottage without a word. The alcohol put us to sleep not long after. Dude, you gotta get up. CJ shook me awake. I turned on the lamp on my bedside table instinctively. I rubbed my eyes awake, looking at CJ. His eyes were wide with fear. He was shaking as he slapped the switch on the lamp. We were plunged back into darkness once again. What the hell, man? I said, sitting myself up. I wrapped my blankets around me. The place was freezing. There's something outside, he said in a frantic, hushed tone. Is it Brandon? I don't think so. Brandon doesn't walk on four legs. I got out of bed, shivering like crazy as I threw on some clothes. CJ ushered me to the living room, where the rest of the guys were already up. All of them were on high alert. I lurched over to the group. What's going on? It's like two in the morning? I grumpily demanded. Something's walking around I already told you, CJ hissed. I didn't hear anything like I normally could. Where do you think it is, Nick? You heard it first, Dakota asked, sounding much calmer than the others. Probably by Jay's room, Nick grumbled. I started hearing what was outside. It was brushing up against the outside of the house. It took heavy steps. I peeked towards my room as the door cracked open. Oh fuck. I saw a lumbering creature with grizzled fur pass my window. It made a gurgling sound as it passed my open window. Is that a bear? Xander asked. Looks that way, Nick said. Let's wait till it goes away before we head back to bed. Brandon's still not back, CJ said a little louder. I swear to God if that bear got him. The moving thing outside stopped, then circled back in the other direction at a faster pace. The back door was a glass one and it wasn't covered up. We were about to see our night terror in the flesh. We all braced, looking for something to defend ourselves with. It was a bear, but something was wrong with it. It was the size of a grizzly, but it had very mangy fur. When the bear tripped the motion light outside, I noticed that one of its paws looked like it had been chewed up. It also had multiple gashes in its side. I could smell the blood from here and it was foul. Holy shit, what do we do? I whined. I had never seen such a wounded large beast in front of me before. Wounded animals are dangerous, but what the hell could have wounded a grizzly like that? Stay. Still. Dakota hissed. It'll piss off soon enough, but if it breaks the glass, we make a break for it. My eyes darted around the room, and when I peered back through the window in my room, I noticed something swaying in the tree line, more like something crashing through the trees. The bear was walking away from the cottage when I heard the shriek. It damn near popped our eardrums, but I could hear the swift scurrying of something fast approaching from the side. I kicked my door shut, hoping it wouldn't make much noise. That definitely wasn't the bear, Xander groaned, covering his ears. Hide! I yelled, ducking behind the couch instinctively. There was enough room that the couches made cover for all of us. I kept my eyes out, looking towards the wounded animal when the carnage unfolded. A long, very bony arm grabbed the bear by the head and snapped its neck. I heard what I could only describe as a giggle coming from whatever did that. The thing stepped more into view. It was gigantic and thin, and when it lowered its head it had a long mane and a dog-like face. It walked on two legs. Much of its hair draped over its naked, wrinkly body. It began to chew on the bear's head. It peered at us, and CJ pulled my head back behind the couch. Oh God, did it see us? I whispered, nearly crying. What is that? CJ cried, doing his best to keep quiet. That's fucking scary, man. Nick whispered, his composure loosening. I hope it's only the bear it's after. Let's keep out of sight. I heard something touch the glass, then drop. It sounded like it was smearing something on the window. I didn't dare look at that. We heard it step around, but eventually it began walking away from the camp. I had to know. I poked my head up from behind the couch and saw it. There were three of them now, the two newer ones smaller than the first. They dragged the bear behind as they ran away into the mountains on all fours. None of us moved from our spot, nor did any of us really sleep. We'd periodically check on one another to make sure we were good, but truthfully, none of us were. Some of us contemplated on calling the cops, or the owners of the cottage, but that was objected to for at least the night. 
It was about 4.30 a.m. when Dakota finally stood up. Guys, he said. Even in the darkness, I could tell he was turning pale. More of us stood up, first Nick, then CJ, then me, then Xander lastly. Is that... CJ slowly asked. I damn near fainted. At the glass door, there was a bloody smear that coated the door from a few feet up to the ground. There was a lump of something on the ground outside. I had hoped it was a chunk of bear, but I was dead wrong. Nick got up and opened the door slowly and the stench of death wafted into the cottage. Oh shit. He groaned and proceeded to puke outside around the corner. I was fearful something was gonna jump out and maul him to death, but he made it inside quickly. The lump of flesh outside was Brandon's maimed, severed head. We all made it back into town, but I don't dare spending another night at a remote cabin or cottage in the Rockies. You're better off at a hotel in Banff or Canmore. Ideally, you're better off spending the night far from these mountains. Just stay out of the Rockies at night, no matter where. If you're alone, they probably will find you. I'm currently hiding in my closet, shaking in fear. I'm typing this out on my phone, so I'm sorry if there's a formatting issue or grammar, but I don't really give a fuck right now. In case I don't make an update to this post, please report this to the authorities or anyone, please. I don't know what to fucking do. During April of 2018, I adopted a five-month-old puppy from the pound. I was lucky enough to get her out of that hellhole and into my loving home. She was a Border Collie mix, and her name was Nellie. I don't know what the fuck happened to her, but what I have now is not my dog. She was a timid little pup when I first took her home. I remember she was inside for at least five minutes before she peed on the carpet. I could only laugh and kiss her because I was so happy. She slept in my bed that night and for many more nights to come. She only weighed maybe six or seven kiugs when I first picked her up. The months that followed were amazing. For the first time since I graduated high school, I was over the moon. Every day when I got home from work, she would rush to greet me with her lead dangling from her mouth, her tail wagging wildly. She absolutely loved to grab the newspaper from the mailbox with me. She was also an awesome chick magnet, but that's besides the point. She loved my neighbor, a nice man named Paul, whose wife had recently passed away from breast cancer. He was an older gentleman well into his 50s, but never looked a day over 40. He liked to throw a barbecue for the few neighbors we had in our little rural community. He always made an effort, so we all returned the favor with bringing food and beer. Things began to change in December of 2018. In the early hours of the morning, on the 5th, I believe, Nellie woke me up. I grabbed my glasses from the bedside table and flicked on the lamp. She was stood about a meter from the door, pointing right at it. I could hear a low growl emanating from her. Curious, I got out of bed and opened the door. To her surprise, there was nothing there. I thought that would have been the end of it. A few more days pass and on the 9th, it happened again. Early hours of the morning and pointing at the door. This continued for the next week. I believe this is when Nellie disappeared. At about 2 a.m. on the 21st, Nellie woke me up and wanted to go outside. She would do this once every few weeks so it was nothing out of the ordinary. She would wake me up by licking my face and then sulk and lay down in front of the door if I wouldn't get up. Behind my backyard is a forest that extends for miles. Sometimes Nellie liked to hunt down rabbits and possums when we would go for a walk through the woods. When I let her out that night, she walked to about five meters before the tree line. I watched her pee and she started her way back to the house. This is when things didn't go exactly as planned. She must have heard something because she whipped around and pointed at the trees and growled. I thought it might have been a rabbit, but thinking back on it now, it was probably something much worse. She barked, then made a beeline for the trees. She disappeared into the thickness before I heard more barking, then nothing. Absolute silence. I was about to grab a torch and put on my red bands, but then the trees started rustling. There was no wind, it was distressing to say the least. Then they stopped. I called out her name and waited. About a minute later, she wandered out of the trees and back inside. I thought nothing of it and promptly went back to sleep. I should have thought about it. 
As the months continued, things got weird. She stopped wanting to go on walks, she cut back on her food, and began to get skinnier. I decided to change up her diet from dog biscuits to meat. She liked that. She really liked that. Sometimes she would run off into the woods to go hunting for rabbits or anything she could get her paws on. I also noticed she began to get bigger. Not fat bigger, because as she got bigger it looked like she got skinnier. Then she stopped playing with her toys. That weirded me out the most because her beloved squeaky duck toy I got for her the day she came home was always with her inside the house. Now it lay gathering dust in the corner of my room. But she began to show a liking to the barbecue get-together Paul would throw. A little too much. Honestly, that should have been a warning sign. That day was the 26th of February, 2019. In the following weeks, people unfortunately died. It was small to begin with, that makes it sound better than it was. Old people died first. As sad as it sounded, we all thought it was because of old age. Then we got the details. Horrific details. They were murders, violent and bloody murders. We were absolutely shit scared then. Paul and I started communicating a lot more than we used to. A text every whore or so just to check in or maybe a phone call or a two. He told me I should keep the key for my gun safe in the lock in case of an emergency. I listened. I listened because I trusted him. I listened because he was one of my only friends. This brings us to tonight, the 24th of March. I awoke to the sound of gunfire. I rushed over to my curtains and yanked them open. Paul's house was on fire. I immediately rushed to put on some thick clothes and grabbed a flashlight and my phone ready to dial 111 for a fire truck. At the time, I didn't even notice my bedroom door was open when I clearly remember closing before I went to bed that night. Nor did I notice Nellie was missing. I yanked open my back door and I froze. It was illuminated by the bright fire of Paul's home. It stood on its hind legs, tall and lanky, completely black with white highlights over its body. The eyes were almost a glowing red. Its claws were massive and sadly one set was clearly protruding through Paul's chest. I was, I actually don't know. It felt like so long ago even though it was only an hour ago. I couldn't feel a thing. I couldn't even feel the flashlight slip through my fingers and land heavily on the concrete ground of my back patio. I instantly realized my mistake and I saw it look at me. It looked me deep in the eye, and I saw her. Her, my sweet girl, my Nelly, or more, rather, what was pretending to be Nelly. It dropped Paul to the ground and terrifyingly reared its head into the air and howled deeply. It sounded like a mix between the sound of absolute pain and what I could only describe as Lupin's howl from Prisoner of Azkaban. That was the only motivation I needed to run. I hauled ass into my bedroom and dived into my closet and shut the door. I covered myself in dirty washing and stayed still. It felt like a laid there for a few million years. It walked, or skulked more rather, into my room. I heard its claws clatter across the hardwood floor before stopping. I couldn't see a fucking thing, but I heard it howl once again before it sounded like it tore my bed to fucking bits. I heard glass smash and hard objects collide with the walls, then nothing. Complete silence once again before I heard I skulk off and leave the house. Probably to finish eating my friend. It's now 7 a.m. I can hear sirens outside, but I'm too afraid to leave, lest that thing is waiting for me on the other side of the door. The inky thing I could do for the last few hours was type this out and do research. But it...
minds off of everything. So we decided to go camping. We were both nature people, deal with it. After about two weeks of planning, we found a good time and spot. In that two week period, I managed to get my license back. So that was good. For this story, I won't give my girlfriend's real name for privacy reasons. So her name will be Elizabeth. We packed all the essentials we would need of a week out in the woods. Tents, clothing, first aid kit, flashlights, a lighter, food, a cooler, knives, a machete, $150 for an emergency, playing cards, a guitar, etc. Also, I brought a CZ USA 85 combat pistol, just in case. Thank God I did. My we packed all of our things into the car and we were on our way. I'll spare you the four hour drive. We stopped at a Burger King about nine miles away from our destination to recharge our batteries and to stretch. Elizabeth pulled out her phone and looked at the weather, only to see that it was going to rain for the entire week. Great, now what are we gonna do, she asked. I guess we should get to the campsite to set up the tents before it's too late. I suggested. We did just that. When we got to the campsite, it started to rain a bit, so we started to unpack as fast as we could. While we were unpacking, we noticed that this campsite was recently used, and the people who were previously there had no respect for nature. There was garbage everywhere. Every third step you would hit a can of beer or a plastic bag and I think at one point I saw an unopened box of tampons. The wind started to pick up too, so all the trash began to fly around in random directions. When we finally got the tent set up and things inside, the rain really started to come down. We managed to secure the tent well, but the rain fly almost blew off. While Elizabeth remained inside to set up the cots, I went out with my poncho and a hammer to secure the rain fly. While pounding the stakes into the ground, I felt a cold wave of dread wash over me. I don't know why. I just felt uneasy. It was as if something was watching me over my shoulder and I didn't know. By now, it was getting pretty dark. If I had to guess, it was about 8.45-ish. I finished securing the rainfly and was about to head inside when I heard a howl a distance away. I thought it might be wolves, but it sounded off like a cross between a scream from a human and a howl from a coyote. I got goosebumps. I headed inside and zipped the door shut. Elizabeth and I snuggled until we both fell asleep. For the next two days, nothing too eventful happened. But the third night is when it appeared. There was no rain that night either. As we were sleeping, I woke up to the same howl I had heard two days prior. But the thing that scared me the most is that it was closer. I shook Elizabeth's shoulder to wake her up. She gave me a partial half-asleep stare. Babe, there's something out the... I was cut off by the howl again, but now it was like 200 yards away. That was enough to wake her. She sat up with sweat pouring down her face and shirt. Why is uh, it coming towards uh, us? Said Elizabeth with fear in her eyes. That's when it dawned on me. We left some food outside after making dinner. It was probably going for our food. We sat in the tent holding each other, shaking with fear in pitch black dark. All of a sudden we hear the howl again, but it was deafening. It was at our campsite. We heard it walking around looking for the food. Well, it found it. We heard what sounded like muffled screaming and loud thumping as it devoured our rations. Elizabeth was hugging me tight and crying into my shoulder. I was frozen just staring into the direction of the noise. The thing kept making these noises and screaming for like three minutes until Elizabeth sobbed into me making some noise. The thing stopped eating. It knew we were there. I embraced Elizabeth and started to silently cry too. This thing actually started to walk towards us. I thought, if I'm going to die here, I won't go down without a fight. I felt around for two things, my flashlight and my gun. I found those two things in about two seconds. I turned on my flashlight and pointed it into the direction the thing was. What I saw made me scream. I saw the silhouette of a creature the size of a full-grown German Shepherd, but way skinnier through my tent wall. But what scared me the most is that Eit stood up on its hind legs and began to touch the tent. I snapped out of it and took one shot at the thing. Bang! It let out the most haunting, blood-curdling scream. I can't even describe it in words. 
I kid you not, it turned around and ran away on two legs. We stayed awake for the rest of the night, fearing it might come back. Luckily, it didn't. But we still heard its screams. At the crack of dawn, we grabbed all we could, jumped into my car and drove out of that area as fast as we could. There was no time to even dismantle the tent. We ended up staying in a hotel for the rest of the trip. That spare cash we brought was worth it. We ended up leaving half of our stuff in the woods, but we didn't care. During the whole car ride out of the area, Elizabeth was crying and hugging my arm. After we returned home, we moved one month later. Elizabeth ended up going to therapy for four months to recover. We now have a baby boy and are living far away from our old home in the woods. We actually have a fear of camping now, but we live in a city now, so there's no problem. If anybody, anybody knows what we saw, please let me know. And may God return the thing we saw back to its home. Hell. I haven't heard from my mom in about three days. That was around the time her beagle buster died and she was really depressed, so I decided to give her some space to cope. So when she called me out of the blue yesterday, sounding all bright and chipper, that was when I knew something had happened. We live in small town Iowa a couple of kilometers north of Spirit Lake. There isn't much to do to pass the time, and since my dad died and I moved out for college, mom relied heavily on Buster for company. I finished up my last semester and went back home ready to fit back into life at least until it was time to go job hunting, and that's when she told me the news about Buster. I tried my best to console her and even promised to get her a new dog, but she wouldn't hear a word of it. Buster was a gift from my dad for their 12th anniversary, so to her, Buster was the last thing that made sense to her, and losing him meant losing my dad all over again. I spent a few nights at her house to try and cheer her up before getting back to my own apartment about 10 minutes away until I got her phone call. The sun hadn't even risen properly above the horizon when I heard my phone rattling on the nightstand. Mikey, you need to get over here right now. You wouldn't believe who came to visit me last night. I had just woken up from a deep sleep and her loud, energetic tone was a little overwhelming for me. Uh, Adam, Buster, he must have come in through the doggy door, although I don't know how because he's so big now. I paused for a minute, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. I looked at the phone screen to make sure it was my mom and glanced at the time to see it was just 5.05 a.m. Are you sure it isn't another beagle? Could be someone else's dog. Of course it's him. I'd know my Buster anywhere, come over and say hi. I wanted to ask more, but between my sleepy haze and obvious confusion, all I managed was, uh, okay. I looked at my phone screen again, unsure if what just happened was a really vivid dream or if my mom had fallen into some psychotic episode. I put on a sweater and slipped on my jeans and sneakers before leaving for her house. All the while over, I was genuinely worried about her mental health and I blamed myself. Dad died around the same time I started school out of state and he was barely in the ground when I up and left mom on her own. The more I thought about it, the more likely it seemed that I was the one to blame for all of this, and to make matters worse, I still didn't have a job. As I bent the corner, I half expected to see Buster running around our front lawn as I had seen him before so many times walking home from high school, but there was no dog. Probably inside, I walked up the cobblestone walkway and heard mom making her ridiculous baby talk that I'd often hear when Buster was still alive. As I walked in through the front door, nothing could prepare me for what I saw as my eyes focused the room. I saw mom sitting on the couch as I had seen her a hundred million times before with a black mass curled at her feet. As my eyes adjusted to the light of the house, I stood frozen unable to say anything. Doesn't he look great, Mikey? What I saw was a man, six to eight. Fuck me. He could have been closer to an even seven feet tall from where I stood wearing a matte black dog mask and full body jumpsuit. The man was so tall he almost completely covered the white carpet 
mom had laid out on the ground. I don't know where he was, but I'm so happy to have my big man back, mom said as she pat the man's stomach. I still couldn't move or say anything. Through the eye holes of the mask, I could see the man studying me intently, and a pang of fear struck my chest. He looked as if he was plotting his next move, thinking of what to do. What did I just stumble upon exactly? I shifted my gaze to my mom and saw that she was in her glee. The only time I saw her this happy was when I told her I got accepted to Nebraska State. It felt so sincere and warm, it tore me up inside. Then I looked back down to the man and looked at his eyes again through the holes of his mask. I could only see his eyes, but I swore they had the most smug look as if to say, yay, I made her this happy when you couldn't. But of course he didn't say anything. He was a dog after all, dogs don't talk. My God, I had to say something. Mom, what the fuck? I blurted out. Of course, that's not exactly the words I wanted to come out, but the shock of the situation sort of chose my words for me. She raised her head, and the warm, doting smile melted from her face. What's your problem? Buster's back, can't you see? Mom, who is that? Where did he come from? Mom looked back at me like I had a skull full of shit. This isn't funny, Mikey. You're scaring Buster with your loud talking. My mom wasn't much of a prankster. Come to think of it, she wasn't much of anything. For as long as I could remember, she pretty much lived for her family. Whatever dad and I liked, she liked as well. But I still held out hope that this was some elaborate joke at my expense. But her eyes and facial expression behind her comically tiny Looney Tunes glasses made me realize that something was terribly wrong. Just when I thought it couldn't get worse, I heard it. Whimpers coming from the thing that lay on the ground. Oh, uh, what's wrong, Bussy? Want to go out, you don't? Okay, we'll stay inside with Mama. I could feel beads of sweat forming below my hairline in clusters. I didn't know what to do. Do I call the police? Clearly, my mom was unwell if she felt this thing was her dead dog. Then, without warning, the man got up on all fours and started growling at me. I felt that pang of fear in my chest again, harder this time. I clearly couldn't count on my mom for help, so what was I going to do? The man in this suit looked like he had at least 50 pounds on me, and he was clearly deranged. Buster, come back here. Leave Mikey alone. He just wants to play with you, Mikey. He hasn't seen you for so long. Then I could see him tensing up as if to charge before waiting. I ran out the open door and back onto the street, not stopping until I got home. As I type this now, it seems ridiculous me running from a grown man in a dog costume, but I don't know. There was something so unsettling about the incident. Clearly, it was a man dressed as a dog, but I don't know. His eyes, while they were definitely human, had something else behind them that seemed inhuman and animalistic. I walked back over to my apartment trying to make sense of what happened all the way. Who was that person? Where did he come from? Was he dangerous? But last, and definitely not least, what do I do now? Do I go to the police? Tell them my mom's home has been invaded by a crazed dogman? Even if I did convince them to come to the home with me, what would they have done? I read a story online once where a man out of some strange fetish decided to live out the rest of his days as a horse in California with his wife now owner, and there wasn't anything the authorities could do about it. Even if the police did something, is that really what I wanted to put my mom through? Between dad's death and my going away, she clearly had a lot of mental baggage and a trip to the police station to file a report, assuming she would in the first place, was the last thing she needed. But still, leaving her in there with whatever the fuck that was wasn't a solution either. I sat on my bed and thought for a while until I realized I had to do something. I walked back over to mom's house, the front door still open. Still unsure of how to approach the situation, I pulled out my pocket knife in case things took a turn for the worse. That's when I saw one of my old neighbors, Miss Johansson, in her patio, looking in the direction of my house. I whistled her over to the sidewalk, careful not to make too much noise for my mom, or Buster, to notice. Mikey is your mom, okay? Uh, why do you ask? She studied me carefully. Well, she's been laughing and giggling really loud, and just before I saw you, she started cursing at someone. I know she lives alone since you left, so I don't know what's going on. Maybe she had the TV on? 
The thing is, it's not just that. Last night I got up to use the washroom and through the window I saw a huge dog in your front lawn. It was about the size of a Great Dane. I thought about calling animal control but who would believe an old cut like me? Who would believe that indeed, I thought to myself. Thanks, Ms. Johansson. I think maybe you should call the police. Usually, Ms. Johansson was the kind of old biddy to ask why, but she sensed the urgency of the situation and hurried inside to call the cops. No sooner had I turned back to face the house, I heard my mom scream. I hopped the wall of the house and walked inside to see the dogman trying to mount my mother as she fought back. I tried to focus on what was happening before my very eyes. His growls and snorts together with my mom's screams almost sent me crazy. My fear and shock quickly turned to rage when I folded out the blade from my pocket knife and threw myself at him at full speed. I crashed into him and took him down to the ground in a move reminiscent of my old Pop Warner days as I slipped the knife between his shoulder blades. I could hear him yelp in pain as I grabbed him and began punching the leather mask he was wearing. I heard his animalistic growls again as he lunged forward and bit my forearm. A bolt of pain ran up my right arm as I tried to pry his mouth open from the mask. Mikey, what are you doing? Was all I could hear from behind me. This fucker was strong. I felt him trying to pull me closer with one arm, but I fought back with everything until I heard the police sirens. The most human look of fear washed over his eyes as he opened his mouth and ran on all fours out the open back door and over the neighbor's fence. I was bleeding everywhere and my mom wore a confused look on her face the entire time. When the police cleared the house and the neighborhood with no reports of a seven foot tall man, I wasn't particularly surprised. I deliberately left out the details of the dog suit. I didn't need the police looking at me side-eyed. We made a report as usual and investigators chalked it up to a homeless derelict who thought he could fit himself into mom's home. It still didn't answer a lot of questions. For now, mom is staying with me at my apartment. I have an appointment lined up with a psychiatrist for her the next morning. I love her so much and I just wanna do what's best for her. What I should have done all along. I hope this whole episode is over. Reading it about a year from now, it might seem a little less terrifying and a little more funny, but the growling I hear ever so often outside my door as I write this doesn't help ease my mind. I live in a small village in rural England. It's a sleepy little place, but for all that, it has a quite a rich history. There's an old castle some ways away that was owned by a feudal lord in the Middle Ages, and legends about the castle and the surrounding countryside about. My favorite legend is the one about the lord and his illicit lady lovers. It's a great story of guilt, revenge, and adventure, and I don't believe a word of it. My friend Sam, on the other hand, his favorite story is the one about the wolf. Legend has it that over 300 years ago, the Lord's eldest son was out hunting when he was set upon by a monstrous hound. It knocked the boy from his horse, crippling him on impact, and then fled into the woods. The Lord's men who had been accompanying the boy had chased after it, with just one man staying behind to guard the lad. When the Lord's men returned to the spot where the accident took place, having failed to locate the wolf, there was no one there, neither lad nor soldier, just a trail of blood and signs of a struggle. The young man was never seen again after that point, but ever since, there have been rumors and whispers of a midnight black wolf that haunts the full moons of our quaint little countryside. It's just a story, but Sam, he believes it. He loves the story, and he loves the imagery of the wolf. One Halloween Sam decided to dress up as the wolf from the legend. He was really excited because this Halloween was actually going to occur on a full moon as well. Now I know what you're thinking. Clearly this story will end up with me mistaking the real werewolf for Sam in his costume at some point. How cliche. Let me assure you that that did not happen. It couldn't have. Sam's costume was good, don't get me wrong. But it wasn't good enough to mistake for the werewolf from the story. It wasn't bulky enough and the mask, which was really just a motorcycle helmet with lots of cardboard, 
and fakey fur all over it wasn't expressive or lively enough for that. The rest of his costume was all right, I guess. He had gotten a lot of dark clothing and covered every part of it in fake fur. Honestly, he really had gone to a lot of effort with the whole thing. What really impressed me was the attention to detail he had used. The cardboard teeth had little droplets of blood painted onto them. He had a tail made from a wire brush that he'd made look pretty authentic, and he walked around in a hunched manner, like he was some bizarre lupine homunculus, struggling with the beast that lay within him. It was obvious that it was a costume, but you had to hand it to him. The costume did look like a werewolf ought to look. It sort of put me off my lunch, to be honest. I mean, it really is quite weird when you eat someone who looks so much like yourself. This happened when I was young, so to be kind we'll say it was a little while ago. I grew up in a small isolated village in Asia. Flimsy wooden houses with roofs made from rusting metal and other scrap materials lined the slosh we called streets. Children ran through the filth barefooted, ignoring the mounding piles of trash and people lived in an uncomfortable closeness where there was little privacy. Desperate merchants occupied any remaining available space trying to sell their knockoff wares and shouting shamelessly at any unfortunate who happened past. For us kids, there was no TV or video games, and sometimes my family, like many others, struggled for basic necessities such as food or clean water. However, despite these conditions and the little we had, I remember my childhood fondly as my family was a loving, close-knit bunch. We were five brothers and two sisters with a great number of cousins, and our parents always worked hard to provide for us. There was only one time in my childhood when I felt truly afraid, and that was when my older cousin Morali became sick with an illness more terrifying and unexplainable than anything I had ever seen. It had been the middle of summer. I was six years old. The sweltering heat was enough to melt away any optimism, and the air hung thick with humidity. That was when a visitor from the Western world arrived in our tiny village. He was a short English man, his round face was a flush red from the weather with beads of perspiration adorning his brow as he stumbled into our village wearing a small hat and explorer clothing. His skinny pale legs reflected back the sun brilliantly and we made jokes at his expense for it, but we also found ourselves captivated by the stories he would tell. We were also a little impressed. He could speak the language fairly fluently. Our favorite story was the one about the Wolfman. A man bitten by a wolf to become a monstrous creature under the full moon of the night, unable to control his beast instincts to kill and devour anyone he came across. It was the tale we requested to hear more than once, and with each telling, he would add new details to alight our imaginations. Our young minds were captivated, listening to his every word with anticipation. In fact, the first English word I learned because of him was werewolf. We would even play werewolf amongst ourselves when we could, one of us would chase while the others ran. If you were caught, you were now a werewolf too. The game was fun to us, until one day a group of us had run the wrong way down an alley and found ourselves face to face with a pack of feral dogs. Now feral dogs were, and still are, an issue that is faced by my home village. The dogs multiply and became aggressive towards people very easily. So it was not uncommon to run into a bad dog or to be chased by one. This is what happened on that day. Upon being disturbed, the dogs growled and barked viciously. My sisters ran, and this caused the dogs to chase. Soon we were all running for our lives from the animals, and at some point during the confusion, Morali had been bitten by a dog. The bite was not so bad, hardly having broken the skin, and there was almost no blood. Collectively, we decided not to tell our parents. We didn't want to get into trouble and instead joked about how Morali was now a wolfman, just like the stories. However, in the days after he was bitten, Morali really did begin to behave strange. He became restless, unable to sit still. He was very agitated and would move about constantly. His movements were not with any purpose or direction, but he started to tell us that he was changing, that he could feel the change. This, of course, scared us. In hushed tones, we discussed what we were going to do now that he was a werewolf. In the Englishman's stories, the beast had been put down with silver, but we had none. 
Days passed as he began to change more. He refused food and water, even going as far as to spit it back up violently. Drool dribbled from the corner of his mouth and down his chin. We reasoned that he was now only hungry for flesh and thirsty for blood. It was at this point that we finally confessed to our parents what had happened, though I am certain they already knew something was wrong before that. We had hoped they would know what to do, but after telling them none of us were allowed to see Murali. We were told this was because his transformation was nearly complete, that he had become aggressive and dangerous, often standing on all fours he would growl and snap at anyone who came near. Thick saliva ran down his chin in an animalistic fashion, and by the end go the week he seemed to us to be truly be an animal. My brothers, sisters and I were all afraid of him. We thought he was sure to change into a wolf any day, and none of them wanted to see him anymore, but I was curious. Curiosity burned in me and I wanted to know if the story was true, if he was really going to turn into a werewolf, so I begged my parents to see him. They looked nervous, but eventually agreed to let me go if I took my older brother with me. My older brother agreed, and together we went to see Murali. The memory of seeing him that day is something I will never forget. He was laying in bed growling like an animal. A frothy white foam bubbled around his lips as he opened and shut his mouth with deep, wet gurgles. His eyes rolled back into his head intermittently, but when they would focus on us, he would growl louder and arch himself into a horrible, painful-looking positions. His mother stayed beside him, dabbing the moisture from his forehead and wiping away the drool dutifully. She was care-avoiding being bitten as she did, though, as he would occasionally snap his mouth shut with force like a snapping turtle. It was terrifying to see him in this way. Some part of me knew then that he was not becoming a werewolf, but I didn't know what was happening either, so I had no other way of explaining it. When I returned home to my parents, they gathered all of us together and explained that if ever any of us were bitten, we needed to tell them right away. Murali died the following day, and it wasn't until years later that I found out what had happened. My cousin was not a werewolf. He was suffering from a viral disease that was eating away the gray matter in his brain. He had a Lysa virus, a fatal disease transmitted through the saliva of the infected. It is a disease that is still active even in the modern world and in advanced countries. A bite, scratch, or lick from an infected animal is all it takes. The worst part of it is that symptoms can appear days, weeks, or even years after infection. And once they do, it's too late. There is no cure. I always had an overactive imagination, and yeah, I could get over-emotional, not to mention I was always fucking weird. So I guess I couldn't blame the people of Stanwick, Georgia, when they didn't believe a werewolf killed my family. No, not many people believed me. Ashley Nelson, the quiet geek. A tall, fit black girl. Even then, I was lonely and constantly alienated by my classmates. My long, wavy black hair and big brown's eyes always besieged by restless mannerisms. Regardless of my quirky fashion and cute glasses, I had a social anxiety I could never harness, a low self-esteem I constantly struggled with, and a quick temper I constantly suppressed. But on that awful April night, my issues were overshadowed by tragedy. At 16, what little innocence I had was forever shattered. The police came to my house around midnight, way too late to save my parents or younger brother Chris from the monster, and way too late to save me from the paralyzing trauma. Our house was a mess, a crime scene closer to a slasher movie than anything resembling real life. Blood and flesh were our new wallpaper, severed limbs and scattered organs our new furniture. This was a redecoration job sculpted by slaughter, and I was the sole survivor, found cowering alone in my room, covered in blood with a few cuts, no bruises, no serious injuries. And yet the police didn't believe my story. Hardly anyone believed me when I said a werewolf killed my family. But ultimately, I wasn't charged for the massacre. Instead, I was set free to the wild, 
free to an unforgiving public. After the summer, my senior year crawled by. Now living with my grandparents, I really had no one to turn to. Not my parents, not Chris. I was alone and against the world. Even grandma and granddaddy never talked to me. Like prison guards, they just kept watch over me behind suspicious glares. Then again, so did all of Stanwyck High. I was the girl who literally cried wolf. Now I was even more hated by my classmates, even more ostracized. And needless to say, my teachers and counselors were less than supportive. In the span of a few months, I'd gone from being ignored to outright despised. From alienated Ashley to the wolf girl, anonymous internet death threats became normal, as did all those dirty looks in public. I was constantly called wolf bitch by Carol Lane and her preppy best friends. I guess I should have been glad I was never charged. There was no evidence against me. I talked to the cops. I told them what happened. How I could do nothing but run to my bedroom. That by the time the werewolf ripped open Chris's innards, my parents were long dead, and I could do nothing. I couldn't help it if I was lucky enough to survive. While I escaped the lycanthrope, I couldn't escape the suspicion. I heard everyone's excuses, everyone's theories. I heard them whispered behind closed doors, shouted on TV, or in all caps on Reddit. All the stories that I was a crazy geek who enjoyed horror movies a little too much. Nobody believed me except my boyfriend Patrick. He was soulful and introspective. With messy brown hair and bright green eyes, Patrick was cute but quirky. The same height as me at 5'8 and a total weirdo as well. Even so skinny, he still had a nice body. And to top it off, Patrick loved writing scary stories. I guess our shared creativity helped fuel our passionate relationship. Not to mention our shared love of horror. Patrick had actually been at my house before I saw the werewolf. He left before nightfall. Before the monster left my family in pieces. And like me, Patrick had been questioned by the police. And also suspected by almost everyone here in Stanwyck. The constant hatred made Patrick and I feel like outlaws at 17. But we did the best we could. And through it all I loved Patrick and always depended on him. Especially since he was the only person who believed me. Patrick was my therapy. And of course the sex was passionate. Patrick made sure of that. But through all the negativity, we had each other. And that was all I needed. By the middle of September, Patrick and I were surviving the torturous prison sentence that was senior year. We were doing okay. Until Carol Lane got a hold of us. Right after third block, she stopped us during our march to the library. Hey, Ashley! Carol's playful southern accent yelled. Helpless, Patrick and I stopped right outside the library, cornered by Carol. Under the dim lighting, we knew no one would be near the library or its long untouched books to help us. Like a gang leader, Carol led her army toward us. All of them were dressed in uniform, all of them in tight name brand ripped jeans and even tighter name brand shirts. There was Carol Lane in all her blonde haired, blue eyed Southern Belle glory. Carol the future prom queen, future valedictorian, and current bitch. Her boyfriend Roy nothing more than an eye candy distraction. He was a dumber and taller version of Carol complete with big muscles, curly blonde hair and flawless skin. Just the type of meathead dunce Carol would likely dump after graduation for smarter, hotter men. Behind the couple lurked their hangers on, Frank, Jean and Becky. Frank and Jean were the B-less couple to Stanwyck High royalty like Carol and Roy. Yeah, they were attractive, but not quite as hot or rich as their idols. Frank was pale with dark hair, social but too corny and silly to be funny. Jean was a light-skinned black girl with big glasses, strong-willed with a long, lean figure. And then there was Becky. I figured she was the ugly one of the bunch. But then again, with her long, coiffed black hair, I guess she was kind of cute behind the extra pounds and thick makeup. Probably could have been much prettier if her self-esteem or fame from being Carol's childhood friend would allow it. Or if Becky wasn't such a grade-A cunt. We just wanted to invite y'all to my party, Carol told us. She exchanged smiles with Roy. Just a little get-together at my house. Yeah, it'll be fun, Becky chimed in, excitement in her squeaky voice. Carol shined her glowing blue eyes toward me. We'd like to get to know you more, Ashley. Showing remorse, she paused. A fresh start. 
Nervous, I looked at Patrick. I like to think I wasn't starstruck by these assholes, but I was. I couldn't say a word. Couldn't tell Carol and her cronies what a pack of assholes they'd been, nor could I tell them to fuck off. Instead, my mind went blank. Honestly, I'd always had a hard time standing up for myself, much less when I was being confronted by Stanwyck High Royalty. Patrick just flashed me a confident grin, totally unfazed by the cool kids. Maybe we should go, he said. He helped me shake off the silence. I don't know, I said. I faced Carol. It's at your house? Yeah, Carol answered with equal parts friendliness and exuberance. It'll be chill, I promise. I hesitated. I don't know. I could feel the clique's collective pretty eyes beaming on me like spotlights. Just let me think about it. With a delicate but persuasive touch, Patrick squeezed my hand. Nah, we'll go. Struggling to suppress my anxiety, I glared at Patrick. But his confident smile, his sheer handsomeness crushed my anger. Carol and her gang lit up with smiles of perfect white teeth. Good, Carol said. Be at my house around five. Still conflicted, I confronted Carol. That's kinda early, isn't it? I asked. Not really, she replied. Carol glanced at her comrades for the support she could always count on. That's what time we usually start. Yeah, that gives us more time to party, Jean added. Faux show, I heard Becky squeal. To my dismay, Patrick didn't fight back. Well, we'll be there, he said. My self-conscious insecurities kept me from groaning right there on the spot. Not only was I a prisoner at Stanwyck High, now I'd be trapped at Carol's house on a Friday night. Before I could persuade Patrick, Carol rode her gang off into the sunset, back to the wilderness of our high school cafeteria. We'll see y'all there, Carol yelled toward us. For emphasis, Roy let out a playful howl, a call of the idiots. Patrick, what the hell was that? I muttered, annoyed. Patrick smiled at me, his cuteness a temporary remedy for my dread. What? he said. It's just a party, babe. A party from hell, I grumbled. Patrick's left hand caressed my face. Look, we'll have fun, all right? I got lost in his green eyes, yet another cure for my constant worry. And if it sucks, we'll just leave early, Patrick continued. I guess he had a point. From what I'd heard, Carol had a Lake Douglas mansion, an isolated fortress by the water, and she also had a shitload of Jose Cuervo. At the very least, Patrick and I could attend for the booze and hopefully get too fucked up to have to deal with any of Carol's bullshit. So I let Patrick drive us over there. His car was easily the ugliest one in the long paved driveway, but we didn't care. By now, both Patrick's chill mood and our little pre-gaming helped me relax. Walking hand in hand, Patrick led me up to Carol's garage door, right past all the lovely cars and cute lawn ornaments. Like a South Georgia Hollywood, Lake Douglas had hills, privacy, and a variety of million-dollar views. And Carol's two-story house was no exception to the neighborhood's luxurious standards. Inside, I was surprised by the low-key party. Not that it was lame or lacking. It was just more chill than I expected. Instead of sorority-like antics or frat house theatrics, all of us just sat in the living room's many recliners and sofas. Just me, Patrick, Carol, and the rest of her tight-knit clique. The five of them still wore their expensive uniforms while Patrick and I rocked our colorful thrift shop finds. My Caribbean blouse, a stark contrast to their pretty blandness. On the huge flat screen, top 40 music videos played at a low volume. In the corner, a small bar featured Carol's notorious treasure chest of alcohol. A hallway connected the living room to all the bedrooms. Small town ornaments gave the house a wholesome charm, while large picture frames showed off photos of Carol and her eternally on vacation parents. The frames represented a sprawling chronology of Carol Lane, from innocent baby to conceited teenager. The booze was potent, strong, and absolutely fucking amazing. This wasn't PBR or Natty Light. You got what you paid for here at Lake Douglas. Throughout the party, everyone stayed in their zones. Outside of pedestrian conversations, no one amongst us outcasts and preps dared cross over to the other side. Not that I minded. As the hours went by, 
Patrick and I were having fun, just chilling and listening to music. Around seven, I stole a glance out a window. The sun was beginning to fade, and once darkness hit, I suspected Carol's calm garden party would turn into a rowdy nightclub, one I was eager to escape. Carol stood up and muted the flat screen. All eyes went to her as she placed her humongous purse on top of the TV. Like she was ready to deliver a toast, Carol held up her red plastic cup. I'm glad everyone could make it tonight. She displayed a wicked smile. We have quite the special event in store. Confused, I faced Patrick. Special event? I asked, my voice louder due to the booze. Cackling, Roy pointed at us. It's just for you, Ashley. Just for Ashley? Jean shouted with drunken enthusiasm. The anxiety roared through me, even through the liquor. Patrick, what are they talking about? Patrick's hand caressed my arm, but not even that could soothe my swirling unease. It's okay, babe, he said. Carol motioned toward the windows. Becky, close the blinds. At Carol's command, Becky lowered all the heavy blinds, squashing the stray sunlight. A few ceiling lights were now our only solace in this upper-class cavern. Awkward, I looked all around us. Carol's gang now gathered by the TV. I don't understand, I said. I looked at Patrick's calm face. What's going on? His grip tightened around my arm. Babe, just relax. No, I pulled away from him and confronted the preps. What the hell is this? We're trying to help you, Ashley, Carol said in a moderate but authoritative tone. Roy pulled Carol in toward him. Yeah, we gotta catch a werewolf. Like a laugh track, all their friends forced a chuckle. I placed my cup on the floor and stood up, my mind somewhere between outraged and intrigued. Is this a fucking joke? I asked. My voice came off weak. I was nothing more than an intimidated mess. Sensing my unease, Patrick grabbed my hand. Babe, they're serious. What? Patrick stood next to me. I already talked to them, Ash. They want to help. That's all they want to do. He leaned in closer. I know you weren't lying, babe. I always knew. And now we're going to prove it. Carol strutted up to us. At first, I didn't believe you. She stopped right in front of me, her poise the polar opposite of my defensive demeanor. But then I figured it out. We all did, Jane added. So you've seen him? I asked, excited. I stole a look at the lineup of cool kids. For once, even Roy was serious. Y'all really believe me? Yep, Becky retorted. We know the truth, Ashley, Carol said. A werewolf did kill your family. Feeling relief, I struggled to suppress my tears. My emotions went wild. It wasn't your fault, Carol added. Reassuring me, Patrick kissed my temple. I told you, babe. Carol walked toward her purse. But there's only one thing. What? I asked. Veering from polite host to wicked competitor, Carol confronted me. One of us is the werewolf. A deathly quiet overtook the room. The entire house. No one said a word, not a sliver of a smirk on any of their attractive faces. I didn't know whether to laugh or cringe or hell even shiver. I looked over at Patrick. I don't understand. What the fuck? No, nah, it's cool, Patrick replied, ain't she serious? Through the confusion, I couldn't respond. Couldn't do anything except just stand there. I did a little investigating, Carol said. She reached inside her purse. None of us had an alibi for that night. I stepped toward her. But how do you know someone is the werewolf? The sight of Carol pulling out a pistol made me stop deed in my tracks. The weapon was old but in mint condition. A real Colt 45 revolver. One fully capable of taking out all seven of use. Oh shit, I yelled. No one else looked surprised they didn't even flinch. And deep in my unsettled gut, I realized they expected the gun. You're fine, Ashley, Carol said in a cool voice. She placed the gun right next to her purse. There's already silver bullets in it. So what? I struggled to say through the shivers. You're just gonna shoot whoever changes? Carol's face took on a new layer of intensity, a southern belle gone mad. Exactly, she said. 
I scanned the scene for help. But like a morbid Greek chorus, everyone wore the same somber expressions, even Patrick. His green eyes now looked darker, hazier, as if the party's sudden shift had subdued his soul. But this is crazy, I said. Supportive, Patrick grabbed my hand. You'll be safe, babe. Unless she's the werewolf, Becky blurted out with glee. I wanted to call her an ugly bitch, but I didn't. Not when everyone kept staring at me. Patrick glared at Becky. That could be any one of us. Annoyed, Becky pointed at me. Well, she's the one who survived. I'd put my money on her. And what if it's you, huh? Patrick yelled. What if you killed her family? His burst of a response silenced Becky. But it didn't stop those harsh stares stuck on us. Look, let's just calm down, Carol said. She strolled up next to Roy. We'll just wait and see. She looked toward the windows. Even with the blinds blanketing the darkness, I could tell nighttime was upon us. I could feel it. Once the full moon's at its peak, we'll open the blinds, Carol continued. She confronted me. Then we'll see the werewolf, Ashley. Just like you did. Trembling, I backed away. No, we need to go. But Patrick held me there. Patrick, I said. He looked into my eyes. You need to see, Ashley. I struggled to pull away, but had no chance at escaping his staunch grip. No, let go of me. Ashley, please. His emerald eyes begged me to stay. They made me a prisoner to the party. You need the closure, Patrick told me in a gentle tone. You can't keep running away. I looked at everyone else. Carol's clique was cooler than ever. Each and every one of them showed no weakness, no fear. Tonight everyone will believe you, Ash, Patrick said. You don't have to be afraid. I looked back at him. They'll believe you, he said, just like I do. Carol clapped, grabbing everyone's attention. All right, I think it's time. Will you do the honors, Becky? Staying close to Patrick, I watched Becky step toward the first window. A dread rather than anticipation built up inside me. Roy grabbed a hold of Carol's hand. Wait, do we have to do it right now? He asked, unease piercing through his confidence. Annoyed, Carol pulled away from him. Uh, yeah. With subtle panic, Roy snatched Becky's arm. Hey, just wait a fucking sec. Frank gave him a weird look. Dude, what's wrong? Like a defensive animal, Roy staggered back toward the hallway. A defiant glare overtook his handsome face. Shit, nothing, all right. I just think we should wait until later. Carol watched him with nothing but sheer suspicion. Why? The full moon's already out, dumbass. God damn it, Carol, Roy shouted. Just fucking listen to me. Scoffing, Carol pushed Becky over toward the window. Nah, fuck that. I watched Becky stop in front of the window. Clear unease made her hesitate, and I couldn't blame her. Look, I just want us to be safe, Roy said to Carol, his voice featuring more rage than concern. I felt Patrick wrap his arm around me. What are you so afraid of, Roy? Patrick hurled at him. Startled, everyone looked at my boyfriend, shocked to hear him challenge one of Stanwick's prized jocks. Roy glowered. Hey, you and your creepy-ass girlfriend can shut the fuck up. Gene pushed Frank over toward Roy. I don't need y'all creeps accusing me of shit, Roy continued. My tower of anxiety grew even higher. Hey, leave her alone, asshole, Patrick yelled at Roy. Trying to play peacemaker, Frank grabbed Roy's arm. Dude, chill. Roy broke away from him. Nah, man, fuck that. He went for the gun. I ain't doing this shit. Concerned, Carol rushed toward him. Roy! Roy's glare latched onto me, especially with that crazy bitch. Motherfucker, Patrick yelled. He lunged at Roy, but I held him back. All the while, the anger boiled up inside me, but no matter what, I couldn't unleash it. I couldn't let my inner beast out. Rather than exposing the fury within, I could only stay silent in Patrick's arms. Right before Roy grabbed the gun, Carol snatched his wrist. What the hell's wrong with you, she shouted. Amidst their struggle, I saw Jean shove Frank toward them once more. Stop, Carol, Roy yelled. Like a guard restraining an asylum inmate, Frank ambushed Roy. 
grabbed both his arms. Stop, man, Frank pleaded. Carol glared at Becky. Becky hadn't moved this whole time, too scared to raise the blinds. Open the blinds, Carol demanded. Carol's voice forced Becky out of her fearful state. Okay, she cried. With a trembling hand, Becky reached toward the lift cord. Nervous, I looked at Patrick, but his stoic calmness failed to soothe me. No, Roy screamed at Becky. Frank struggled to hold him in place. God damn it, Roy. Be careful, the concerned Jean shouted at Frank. Becky grabbed the cord. With a scratchy snarl, Roy shoved Frank across the room. Frank! Jean cried. Startled, Becky collapsed back against the wall. A scared mess who damn sure wasn't going to open those blinds now. In a terrifying display of strength, Roy turned and bolted for the hallway. His movements so manic, his howls murky and unsettling. My stomach sank to the floor. The noises hearkened me back to past trauma, back to the werewolf's wails, back to my family's tortured screams. What the fuck? Carol yelled. Jean helped Frank off the ground. Oh God, are you okay? She said, concerned. Then Roy's animalistic cries rang through the house. Nothing but his howls and snarls hit us on a horrifying loop. Acting on simultaneous courage and stupidity, Frank snatched the gun. Jean reached toward him. Frank, just stay here, Frank said. He ran toward the hallway, straight toward another harrowing howl. What the hell are you doing? Carol cried after him. Within seconds, Frank had disappeared into the upper-class jungle, the snarling and Frank's frenetic footsteps all we could hear. Frank! Jean yelled. She stepped toward the hallway. Carol restrained her. No, don't! Frank, come back! Jean shouted. Like a timid soldier, I did my best to stagger off toward the window, further away from those sounds. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Becky slouch to the ground. She covered her ears in a pathetic attempt to quash those nocturnal howls. Patrick looked toward me, worried. Ashley! A sudden scream surrounded us. A human scream. No, Frank! Jean yelled. Acting off adrenaline, she pushed Carol away and followed her boyfriend's cries. Carol pulled Becky off the ground. Carol's intense blue eyes zeroed in on me. Come on! Patrick grabbed a hold of my hand. Together, we followed after two preps. Patrick and I lagging behind in this long, dark hallway. By now, Frank's screams had faded off into an unnerving silence. All I could hear was footsteps and the occasional guttural growl. Then a loud thud echoed toward us. I jumped upon hearing it and I could feel Patrick do the same. Up ahead, I saw Carol drag Becky through an open door on the left. Come on, Ashley, I heard Carol shout. At the open doorway, I felt Patrick let go of me. Patrick, I cried. Turning, I caught a brief glimpse of his uneasy face. Babe, I started. Carol's groomed hand yanked me inside. I stumbled inside the study. A large desk sat in the center of the room. Several antique bookshelves lined up against the wall, all of them crammed with hardbacks and more cherished photos of Carol Lane. A huge window overlooked Lake Douglas. The blinds were lifted, revealing a glorious full moon shining upon us. Its beams so bright, the remnants strayed into the hallway. I stopped at the desk, right by Becky and Carol. Near the window, I saw Jean crying over a bloodied body. Frank was sprawled out like a red snow angel. Crimson ran all along his face and torn t-shirt. Frank the victim of a most brutal attack. The revolver laid a few feet away, silver bullets and all. Oh God, Becky shouted, he's dead. Horrified, I turned toward the door, in desperate search of Patrick. Carol snatched my arm in a death grip. Ashley, look out. Like a cheesy horror sound effect, a howl roared to life right behind me. One more befitting monster mash than an American werewolf in London. Whirling around, I saw a creature rise up behind the desk. Roy had transformed, his face replaced by pointy ears, a long snout, spurts of thick black fur, and two hungry red eyes. Snarling, he lunged at me. I screamed and tumbled to the ground, right by Frank's dead body. Another corny howl pierced my ears. Scared shitless, I reached for the gun, until I got a closer look at this teenage lycanthrope. Roy still had on his flawless name-brand t-shirt and jeans, his muscular arms and legs completely unscathed by excessive hair. Roy's howling shifted from campy spookiness to howling laughter. 
Then more laughing surrounded me, and I saw now everyone was chuckling and pointing at me. Carol, Jean, Becky. Even Frank sat up, the fake blood unable to drown out his mean-spirited cackle. Oh shit, we got her! Jean cried out. Like an invisible force, the heavy laughter combined with the mask's narrow eye sockets made Roy stagger against the desk. Woo! He yelled. That bitch got scared quick! I sat there on the verge of tears, my self-conscious soul on the verge of suicide. The hurt sunk into my flesh like sharp hooks. I couldn't say anything. Carol pulled Jean off the ground. Frank too dominated by drunken amusement to even stand on his own. Well, Carol began. Trying to control her sadistic laughter, she pointed over at Roy. There's your werewolf, Ashley. Leaving his mask on, Roy raised his arms and lumbered toward me. His act about as creepy as an intoxicated straggler leaving a Halloween party. His howls now more obnoxious than ever. I cringed at the silly sight. The girl who cried wolf, Jean quipped. Indeed, Carol replied. Chuckling, Becky walked over toward the window. A closer glance at the full moon. Y'all got her good, she said to an audience of none. Still reeling from the scare, I crawled back toward the door. I realized teardrops were sliding down my face, and like always, I couldn't fight back. I really was going to weep like a scared child in front of the cool kids. The gang's giggling only grew louder, a laugh track well off the rails, a live studio audience for my pitiful state. With obnoxious glory, Carol pointed right at me. Hey y'all, she just saw another wolf. Looks like it, Frank quipped. A booming snarl ended their laughter real quick. Now fear latched into all of them, outright terror. Everyone watched the beast lunge into the study, a muscular werewolf walking on its furry hind legs. The creature's brown fur was brisk and spiky, its ears long and slender just like the monster's intimidating snout. In the room, the werewolf flashed us a smile of razor-sharp teeth, its eyes redder than the fake blood scattered across Frank's body. Only tattered clothes were stuck to the werewolf's army of fur, and like huge retractable blades, eager claws extended out of its hands. I recognized those hipster clothes, and even from here I could tell the creature was exactly my height. Panicking, Roy grabbed Carol. Oh fuck! His muffled voice yelled through the mask. Before Carol could scream, one quick swipe from the creature declared a double decapitation. Carol and Roy's heads tumbled to the ground. Their severed necks erupted like volcanoes of dark red gore. Roy's dying eyes looked on at me. Sticky blood covered the mask's cheap fur, the plastic ears now crooked and bent. His mask a pathetic counterpart to the real thing standing before us. I watched the other teens scream in horror, and for once I was glad my self-doubt kept me from taking action, especially since it kept me from helping these assholes. Right now, I was one entertained audience. There was Frank reaching for the Colt 45. Only the werewolf's bare foot splattered Frank's head into a busted jack-o'-lantern of gooey flesh. Screaming, Jean and Becky rushed toward the door. The werewolf's bellowing snarl ushered them into a frenzied panic. Both girls kept stumbling into one another, their attempt at escape so sloppy. Get out of my way, bitch! Jean yelled. She pushed Becky back, straight into the clutches of the creature. Becky cried out. Her squeaky scream silenced once the werewolf jammed its paw straight down her throat. Blood sprayed across the monster's hungry face. It retrieved its paw in a quick flourish, yanking out all sorts of intestines. A goody bag of Becky's organs. Becky's corpse hit the floor, her mouth agape in a huge oval, a wide enough opening for a red river to come rushing out. Right when Jean reached the open door, the werewolf snagged her back in, its tight grip sunk straight into her fragile flesh. No, she cried. The monster turned her around. A brief taunt of deep breaths and sloppy saliva hit Jean's face. She cringed in helpless fear. She knew she was fucked, and all she could do was scream and scream again. The werewolf went to town on her vulnerable face. A machine of chomping ensued, the monster's mouth quicker and messier than a blender. Jean's screams died even as remnants of her mouth kept twitching. Her flesh and all-you-can-eat buffet devoured in mere seconds. As the werewolf finished literally defacing my classmate, I reached out and grabbed the gun. I staggered to my feet. Through the tears, my gaze strayed toward the window. 
the lift cord for the blinds was well within reach. Victorious, the monster threw down Jean's body. She landed with a splat near all the others, now all their blood intertwined, the five bodies laying side by side in a prep cemetery. I stared at the werewolf. Deep down, I knew I'd never seen it before. This wasn't the monster that killed my family, or at least I didn't think it was. My trembling hand did its damnedest to hold the gun in a tight grip. Patrick? I yelled out, my tone strong and steady for once. Drawn to my voice, the creature confronted me. Even behind the terrifying exterior, I knew Patrick recognized me. His eyes always gave away his emotions, even when they were red instead of green. Breathing heavy, Patrick stepped toward me. His ominous footsteps splashed through multiple red puddles. I pointed the gun right at him, but who was I kidding? Patrick didn't even flinch, much less slow down. He knew I couldn't pull the trigger. I took a deep breath and wiped away my tears. I love you, I said to him. Reaching out, I pulled the cord. Like a dropped curtain, the blinds whisked straight down. The full moon was blanketed. Through the darkness, I heard Patrick howl in pain, heard his anguished cries. Terrified by the noises, I stumbled toward the desk. I struggled before finally turning on a lamp. There was Patrick cowering a few feet away, weakened yet alive, and in human form. Exhausted by the transformation, Patrick looked at me with those green eyes. Somehow, he now looked even sexier, more radiant. I guess those revealing ripped clothes may have helped. Patrick! I yelled in excitement. I dropped the gun and rushed toward him. Babe, he said. A weak smile crossed his lips. I hugged him close, an embrace for the ages. Oh my God, I'm glad you're okay. Amused, Patrick looked at me. You ain't hugged me like that in a long time. I blushed, then struggled to tell him what needed to be told. Look, I need to tell you. Still smiling, Patrick traced his smooth hand along my face. I already know, babe. Shockwaves rushed through me. What? I guess we, uh, both have our little secrets. Patrick's grin remained. Yet it wasn't taunting or vile, but comforting. Supportive like he always was. I don't know, I finally said. I've never told anyone. And you don't need to, Patrick responded. He stroked my hair. I know you killed them. I know you did it, Ash. And he was right. The whole town was right. The ticking teenage time bomb that was Ashley Nelson had finally exploded. A Jody Arias meltdown led to me massacring my entire family. Sure, I'd tried to suppress those painful memories. And in some ways, maybe my werewolf story was true. Maybe Patrick had given me a helping hand that night. But amidst the immense anger, I couldn't remember much. Honest. All I did was give Patrick a knowing smile. His secret was safe with me, and mine with him. You don't have to tell me shit, babe, Patrick said in that deep, sexy voice. Smirking, he leaned in closer. A rebellious twinkle in those emerald eyes. I know what it's like to get frustrated, to fight back. Like tonight? I quipped. Patrick chuckled. Hey, I did that for you. He motioned toward the bodies surrounding us like scattered rice and bouquets of flowers at a wedding. I knew what they were going to do. He caressed my face. His mere touch melted my heart. I couldn't let them hurt you, Ash. You know I couldn't. My smile grew even wider. No one had ever stuck up for me like that, not even myself. And now I had a werewolf on my side. I struggled with the same issues, babe, Patrick went on. I know. Patrick's eyes pierced into mine. And I know what can help. Reflective, I looked back toward the big window, where the full moon awaited us. If you just let me do one bite, you'll be like me he said. You'll be confident. Shushing him, I put a finger to Patrick's lips, flashed him my own sly smile. You don't have to say no more. In that moment, I knew I'd found my werewolf soulmate, and now I wanted to join. After all, I always had a hard time saying no. So why stop now?